Hey there, good guys and gals, especially you bad guys and gals. It's Pick 6 Movies time, and we are getting super heroic. If this is your first time in the League of Bad Movies, let me tell you a little bit about what we do. We pick a clever theme for each season, this being our 23rd stab at such cleverness, a season we call Stream On, all about straight-to-streaming movies on all those Hulus and Netflixes and HBO Maxes. And then we select six movies from the filth and mire of cinema that fit that theme. We've done two so far this season, which makes this episode three by my math. So what we'll do is we'll get Chad in here to give us a little history about this movie and its star, and then I'll be back on the other side to trace the plot of the movie and make some very witty observations. I think you'll like it. But enough of the teasing, let's get down to some pleasing. With a new slam bang episode of Pick 6 Movies all about the straight-to-streaming superhero thing, Samaritan. Take it away, Chad. John Paul Labefish was serving in the U.S. Navy during the First World War, where he met Jean Victoria Ann Cleric, who went by the name Adrienne. Adrienne was from Brittany, France, and the two fell in love. John's parents were Jewish immigrants from Ukraine who immigrated to the United States. The two eventually married and made a home in Washington, D.C., where John worked as a lawyer. They eventually had two daughters. The eldest was Jacqueline, who had her sights set on being an entertainer. Jacqueline pursued interest, including working as a trapeze artist, working with the Flying Walendas and the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. She also worked as a chorus girl in nightclubs and found some success as a hairdresser. Through her family connections, Jacqueline met and befriended famed bodybuilder Charles Atlas. Her interest in physical fitness and entertainment led her to having the first daily television show dedicated to physical fitness in the Washington, D.C. area. This led to her opening a gym specifically for women called Barbellas. Oh, I get it. Barbell, Bellas, Barbellas. (laughs) That's clever. Prior to her punny women's only exercise endeavor, Jacqueline met and fell in love with a barber named Frank. The two eventually wed, and they had two sons. She continued her eclectic blend of interest, including astrology and palm reading. In the 1970s, she opened some beauty salons, where she sold her own self-created lines of skincare products. And for the most part, Jacqueline led a quiet, albeit eccentric and entertaining life. And then in 1976, everything changed for Jacqueline, or Jackie, as she was more commonly known because that was the year that her eldest son appeared in a movie that took home the Oscar award for best picture and best director. That same movie found her oldest son receiving Oscar nominations for best actor and best original screenplay for the film Rocky. Michael Sylvester Gardenzio Stallone was born on July 6, 1946 at a charity hospital in Hell's Kitchen in the area of New York City. During his birth, forceps damaged a nerve in his face which led to a speech impediment and a droop to his left eyelid. Most of his infancy was spent in boarding care until he was around five years old when circumstances allowed him to return to his family in Maryland. His parents divorced and Stallone lived with his father Frank until the age of 15 when he moved to Philadelphia to live with his mother, Jackie Stallone. Stallone had a history of troubles in school resulting in 14 expulsions. This landed him at Devereux Manor, a school for emotionally troubled teens. At the school, Stallone began to play football and got interested in weightlifting. This led to him receiving a scholarship to the American College in Switzerland, where he spent two years coaching girls' athletics. And it was here that he found interest in the dramatic arts, appearing in a production of Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman. Stallone returned to the United States and attended the University of Miami, where he studied drama. He eventually moved to New York to pursue a career in acting. He auditioned for and got some work here and there. Most famously, he appeared in the 1972 film The Party at Kitty and Studs, a softcore porno film that would later be re-released as The Italian Stallion to capitalize on Stallone's stardom years later. Stallone was paid $200 for two days' work, money that he used to keep from being evicted from his apartment. Prior to moving into this apartment, Stallone had the displeasure of sleeping at the Port Authority bus terminal in New York as he had no home to go to. At the time, Stallone lived with his then-girlfriend, Sasha Zack, also an aspiring actress. Stallone auditioned with minimal success, leading him to take odd jobs working at a zoo and a movie theater where he was fired for scalping tickets. 
Stallone would go on to marry his girlfriend at the time. During these early days, Stallone did appear in a handful of small film roles, including Woody Allen's comedy Bananas and the detective mystery Clute starring Jane Fonda and Donald Sutherland. Both of these films came out in 1971, but Stallone's acting career was not taking off the way he wanted. Things got rough as money got tight. Stallone was all but ready to throw in the towel, to use a boxing term, after trying and failing to get work as an extra on Francis Ford Coppola's film adaptation of Mario Puzo's novel The Godfather. But a friend with whom Stallone was acting in a stage production recommended him for a role in the film Lords of Flatbush, which Stallone landed. The Lords of Flatbush also featured actor Henry Winkler, as a character that was strikingly similar to Winkler's iconic character, Arthur Fonzarelli, AKA the Fonz from the hit TV sitcom, Happy Days. Lords of Flatbush came out near the end of Happy Days season one final episode. So the similarities in the characters was more coincidental and did not impact the casting of Winkler in one or the other. Although Winkler did state in interviews that working with Sylvester Stallone on Lords of Flatbush impacted his portrayal of Arthur Fonzarelli. Stallone and his wife eventually moved to Hollywood to continue to pursue their careers. Stallone got work in a handful of films, including 1975's Capone and Death Race 2000. TV audiences saw him in small parts on Kojak and Police Story, but nothing was really happening to his career yet. Sylvester Stallone was also interested in all aspects of filmmaking in front of and behind the camera. The boxing match between Muhammad Ali and a comparatively unknown boxer Chuck Wepner inspired Stallone to write the script for Rocky, reportedly completing the first draft in just over three days. Now, if you've never seen the film Rocky, what's wrong with you? But here's the long and short of the plot. Rocky Balboa, an unknown boxer, is given a chance to fight the heavyweight champion, Apollo Creed. It's the story of a quiet underdog given the opportunity of a lifetime to rise above the world in which he was born. Stallone began to shop the script around and studios were eager to make the movie, but Stallone had one requirement. He wanted to star in the film. Eventually producers Erwin Winkler and Robert Chartoff agreed to Stallone being cast as Rocky Balboa. Rocky got made and was released in theaters in 1976. And the movie Rocky was huge. I cannot understate how big this movie was. First off, the film was made for a little over a million bucks, although advertising for the film ultimately skyrocketed to a little over $4 million based on growing popularity of the film. But at the end of the day, Rocky ended up making $250 million. Now, before all of this success, filmmakers found it challenging to cast other people in the movie with Stallone in the lead role. Originally, filmmakers wanted Ken Norton, an actual boxer who was in part inspiration for the character of Apollo Creed to play Apollo Creed. But he pulled out and it was Carl Weathers who slipped into the red, white, and blue boxing trunks. Excellent career move, Mr. Weathers. Carrie Snodgrass, who appeared in the film Diary of a Mad Housewife, and Susan Sarandon, who at the time had a string of TV credits to her name, all auditioned for the role of Adrian. Hey, that was Stallone's grandmother's name. Ultimately, it was Talia Shire, who was fresh off her performance as Connie Corleone in The Godfather that landed the role of Rocky Balboa's quiet, homely love interest. It should be noted that the same year Rocky came out, The Godfather 2 hit theaters, so big year for Talia Shire. Excellent career move there. John Abelson directed the movie for which he won an Oscar. Abelson would go on to direct John Belushi in that actor's last feature film, Neighbors. He also directed The Karate Kid and its two following sequels and would return to the Rocky sequels as the director of Rocky IV, or as Mr. Bo Ransdell calls it, Montage, the movie. <laughs> Rocky's low budget meant that Stallone had to recruit family members to support production as needed. Stallone's wife, Sasha, worked as the still photographer for the film. Stallone's father is the bell ringer at the start and end of each round during the final boxing match of the movie. Stallone's brother, Frank, has a cameo as a street singer, and he contributed a song to the movie's soundtrack. And speaking of the soundtrack, Bill Conti composed one of the most iconic and recognizable soundtracks of any movie in the history of movies ever. 
Previously, Conti composed music for the film WW and the Dixie Dance King, starring Burt Reynolds and Jerry Reed. Note to self, track down a copy of WW and the Dixie Dance Kings. The director of that movie was John Avildsen, who directed Rocky. Avildsen went to Conti and said, hey, I got $25,000 for you to make the music for this film. This was just enough money to pay the musicians, rent the studio, and record everything. Now that endeavor led Conti to win an Academy Award for Best Original Song, Gonna Fly Now, which reached number one on the Billboard charts in 1977. And Conti's career after that skyrocketed, as did the careers of many people involved with the film Rocky, most notably the career of Sylvester Stallone. The film Rocky was a cultural phenomenon in the United States. Sure, it made a lot of money, but it was beloved by audiences and critics alike. Pick Six Movies film critic emeritus Roger Ebert gave the movie four stars, comparing Stallone to a young Marlon Brando. And for many critics and moviegoers, the positive message and kind-hearted protagonist of the film was a contrast to the other cynical, somber, and downtrodden movies at the time, specifically Network, Taxi Driver, and All the President men. These were movies that Rocky beat out to win Best Picture at the Oscars in 1977. Following Rocky, Sylvester Stallone was a hot commodity and appeared in two movies, Fist, where he played a warehouse worker who gets involved in labor unions. That movie was directed by acclaimed director Norman Jewison. The other movie was Lords of Paradise, about two brothers from Hell's Kitchen who get involved in professional wrestling. That movie was written and directed by Sylvester Stallone. Critics felt the movie was kind of a warmed over Rocky, and neither of them really set the box office on fire. During this time, Stallone was busy working on a script for Rocky II, and it was decided that he would direct that sequel as well. The original director, Avildsen, was busy working on Saturday Night Fever, the film that would make John Travolta a movie star. Rocky II comes out and it is a huge success, with one critic stating that the movie dares you to root again for the ultimate underdog and succeeds due to an infectiously powerful climax. Although wildly successful, Rocky II did not surpass the original film in its box office returns. However, it helped to solidify Sylvester Stallone as a movie star and a powerful filmmaker in Hollywood. In 1981, Stallone starred alongside Michael Caine and international soccer superstar Pele in the film Victory about World War II prisoners of war. Then came Nighthawks, a neo-noir crime thriller with Stallone as a New York City cop who plays cat and mouse with foreign terrorist Rutger Hauer. And then in 1982, lightning struck twice. Sylvester Stallone found himself playing former Green Beret and Vietnam veteran John Rambo in the film First Blood. The movie was a success with critics and audiences. However, Stallone felt prior to the film's release that it would kill his career. So much so that he took steps to buy the movie and prevent it from being released in theaters. The biggest reason Stallone didn't like the movie was that the character of John Rambo had a lot of dialogue, commenting on all of the action of the film. With an original runtime around three hours, Stallone went to the filmmakers and suggested that they cut out as much of John Rambo's dialogue as possible. And they took his advice, and the film made over $125 million in its original theatrical release. First Blood also benefited from the fact that Rocky III came out five months earlier. With the help of casting Mr. T as the antagonist, Survivor's hit song Eye of the Tiger and the growing star power of Sylvester Stallone led this third installment to make more money than the original Rocky film. Sylvester Stallone was on an undeniable winning streak that could not be stopped. That is, until he directed Staying Alive the sequel to Saturday Night Fever, one of the few movies with the dubious honor of having a 0% freshness rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Stallone decided to broaden his range and star in a comedy that also allowed him the opportunity to sing on film in Rhinestone alongside the person that everybody loves, Dolly Parton. A movie that was written by Sylvester Stallone and Phil Alden Robinson, the guy who wrote Field of Dreams and Sneakers, 
This movie was based on the hit song Rhinestone Cowboy. Stallone reportedly turned down starring in Romancing the Stone and Beverly Hills Cop to make this film. Now I've seen Rhinestone more times than I care to admit, and it is terrible. But Dolly Parton is a lot of fun to watch, and Sylvester Stallone showed he can be kind of somewhat funny. However, screenwriter Robinson said in an interview that the film was supposed to be directed by Mike Nichols, who directed The Graduate and Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, and that the movie was to be a little more gritty and grounded. Nichols backed out, and Bob Clark, who directed Porky's and A Christmas Story, stepped in, and the movie leaned into more of the silly elements of the screenplay, delivering a product that wasn't what the creators originally envisioned. And just like Stallone did after he had a few unsuccessful outings following the original Rocky, he went back and made sequels to his other earlier films. Rocky IV came out, Ra Raing America, Poo Pooing Russia, Rambo First Blood Part II comes out, both of these movies in 1985, and they were wildly successful. This very same year, Stallone and his first wife divorced. They had two sons, Sage and Sergio, the latter of which had been diagnosed with autism at a very early age. That divorce was finalized in February of 1985, and then later that year in December, Stallone married actress Brigitte Nielsen. Perhaps looking to catch lightning in a bottle for a third time, Sylvester Stallone starred as Marion Cabretti, a tough-as-nails street cop in the movie Cobra, where he appeared with his now-new wife, Brigitte Nielsen. Cobra was a marginal success, but not so much that they decided to make sequels. Stallone's career then went into a bit of a downward turn, as he continued to make less than sequels to both the Rocky and Rambo franchises that made him a superstar. He also continued to crank out 80s era action films, and occasionally he tried his hand at more comedic roles. Rambo 3, Tango and Cash, Rocky 5, Stop or My Mom Will Shoot, Cliffhanger. All of these are movies that dim Stallone's star power just a bit. In 1987, Stallone and Brigitte Nielsen got a divorce after two years of marriage. The next year, 1988, Stallone started dating model Jennifer Flavin. They dated for six years. Then it came out that Sylvester Stallone was reportedly the father of a child with Janice Dickinson, but DNA tests confirmed that Sylvester Stallone... Maury, what do they say? You are not the father. <laughs> this good news led Sylvester Stallone and Jennifer Flavin to reconcile, and they got married in 1997 and they ended up having three daughters. Oh, that's nice. Now, 25 years after being married in August of 2022, Flavin filed for a dissolution of marriage. Oh man. Up, oh, but then in August of that same year, they reconciled. Oh, good for them. Let's get back to Sylvester Stallone's string of stinkers and his return to greatness. Stallone wrapped up the 90s with a string of questionably successful films. Demolition Man, Judge Dredd, Daylight, he appeared in the movie Copland with Robert De Niro, Ray Liotta, Harvey Keitel, and most likely Harvey Keitel's penis making an appearance. And then in the early 2000s, there was a string of bad movies. The remake of Get Carter, Driven, Avenging Angelo, Detox, all movies you may not even remember. He took a turn as the bad guy in Spy Kids 3, which was a financial success, but it didn't do much to bolster Stallone's acting career. As reality television was all the rage in the early aughts, Sylvester Stallone and Sugar Ray Leonard headlined a boxing reality competition series called The Contender. But for three years, Stallone didn't release a movie. This was the longest hiatus he had from filmmaking since he began his career in 1969. When Stallone did return, it was once again to the character that made him a superstar in the sixth installment of the Rocky franchise with Rocky Balboa. And once again, Stallone found a way to make audiences root for the perpetual boxing underdog. The movie was a financial success and fans and critics loved it alike. Breathing life into that franchise led Stallone to star in an ultra-violent fourth installment of the Rambo franchise titled Rambo. It was met with mixed reviews and was not as widely well received as Rocky Balboa. Then Stallone spearheaded The Expendables, a movie franchise for aging action film stars from the 80s and 90s. Jason Statham, Jet Li, Dolph Lundgren, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Bruce Willis, Chuck Norris, Jean-Claude Van Damme, Wesley Snipes, and Mel Gibson. <gasps> If you shot a gun in a movie and had a stunt double at some point in the 80s or 90s or early 2000s, then you were probably part of the cast of the Expendables franchise. 
Stallone just did what he did best, don't reinvent the wheel. This led Stallone to stepping in and helping to nurture the Rocky film franchise spinoff Creed, where Stallone played an aging Rocky Balboa alongside the son of his former boxing antagonist, Apollo Creed. Now, at the time of this recording, there are three movies in this series, but heck, who knows what the future holds? Stallone was cast as the legendary Revengers captain and leader of the Stockar Revenge clan in the Guardians of the Galaxy franchise. He reprised his role of John Rambo in Rambo Last Blood, embracing the ravages of time on this deeply damaged character. He also lent his voice talents to King Shark in James Gunn's reboot of The Suicide Squad. Stallone is an elder statesman. He's embraced his age and his legacy, letting his limitations be his greatest strengths, taking on roles that suit him and showcase his talents as an actor and a movie star by filling roles that align with the character traits audiences respect and enjoy most about him as an actor. Now we have to talk about Samaritan. Before the pandemic came in and screwed everything up, it was announced in May of 2018 that Sylvester Stallone would be launching Balboa Productions. Shortly thereafter, in February of 2019, the superhero movie Samaritan was announced as one of the feature films in the works for this production company. It was also announced that Sylvester Stallone would be starring in this movie as well. The screenplay was written by Brad Shutt. Shutt was the creator of the TV series Threshold. I don't know what that's about. He wrote the film Season of the Witch, starring Nicolas Cage and Ron Perlman. That sounds like something terrible we would review on this podcast. What else did Brad Shutt write? Oh, he wrote that Escape Room movie. Never saw that. And he wrote its sequel. Certainly didn't see that. And it looks like he wrote a bunch of episodes of Ninjago and Samaritan. Well, we kind of know what we're dealing with now, don't we, people? Prior <laughs> to production... The screenplay was turned into a series of graphic novels and published by Mythos Comics. In September of 2019, Jules Avery came aboard as director. Certainly, he didn't know there was a pandemic right around the corner. Avery, who grew up in Australia, had a long list of short films to his credit. He had the 2014 feature film, Son of a Gun, starring Ewan, don't call me Obi-Wan, McGregor, and Brandon Thwaites. Never heard of that movie. In 2018, he released Overboard, which was produced by J.J. Abrams' Bad Robot production company. This was a movie about World War II soldiers who find out that the Nazis are up to no good. Well, duh. Uh, a bunch of human experiments and zombies are running around. Never heard of that one either. But I have heard of Samaritan. So in February of 2020... It was officially announced that Sylvester Stallone would star along with a cast that includes Martin Starr, who was on Silicon Valley as Guilfoyle, and he was uh, in those Tom Holland Spider-Man movies. I think he was a science teacher. Uh, he was on Freaks and Geeks. He's been in a bunch of stuff. Pretty good, funny guy. Moses Arias, who was on Hannah Montana, was also going to be in the movie. I have no idea who that is. Dasha Polanco, who was on Orange is the New Black, was cast as the mother of Sam, the hero boy in the film. Sam was played by Javon Walton, but he likes to go by the name Juana. Our bad guy was going to be Ewan McGregor lookalike Pilu Asbeck. Filming was slated to start in early 2020 in Atlanta, but then COVID showed up and threw a wrench into the whole production. By March of that year, all production was shut down, as was most of the world. But by October of later that year, filming resumed because filmmakers didn't know that a huge wave of COVID was coming over the December and January months of that and the following year. Eventually, they somehow completed production on this filming despite COVID, and the majority of it was shot in Atlanta, Georgia. The movie was supposed to hit theaters in June of 2021, but that got canceled due to the Omicron <laughs> variant of coronavirus and nobody was going to the theaters. So eventually, it headed to streaming services, specifically Amazon Studios, because they gobbled up MGM that year, and now somehow they owned all of this content. Now, we're just moments away from discussing this movie in way too much detail, but I can tell you that reviews of the film by critics are not that great. Over on Rotten Tomatoes, it's got about a 38% freshness rating with 100 reviews to back that up. 
One thing that appears to be universal about the reviews is that Sylvester Stallone's considerable star power is still strong. Stallone enjoys himself in the movie and his age aligns more than not with the film's narrative and main character. Could this be a new franchise for Sylvester Stallone to reach the heights of Rocky Balboa or John Rambo? Possibly, but more likely the answer is no. Could there be a prequel? Maybe. Could this spawn a long form series that nobody asked for? Possibly. How about an animated series? Who knows? There's so much content out there, I don't know what's going on. But I do know this, Sylvester Stallone isn't sitting around waiting for someone to call and give him an offer to work. Paramount Plus, the streaming service, they launched Tulsa King recently, where Sylvester Stallone plays Dwight the General Manfredi, who gets exiled to Tulsa, Oklahoma, where he starts to build a new criminal enterprise. That series stars Martin Starr, you know, from the hit streaming film Samaritan. It also has Andrea Savage, who was very funny on her FX sitcom, I'm Sorry. It got canceled way too soon, in my opinion. And this series was created by Taylor Sheridan, the guy behind Yellowstone. I mean, all of this sounds pretty good, but I gotta be honest, I'm never gonna watch it, but I'll tell you, it sounds pretty good. Sylvester Stallone is one of the remaining movie stars of a bygone era. Having his name associated with the project immediately draws an audience and garners attention. Throughout his roller coaster of a career, Stallone has rolled with the punches that his professional and personal life have thrown at him. He came from the streets and was given a shot, and through it all, audiences seem to root for him each and every time he returns. Is Samaritan a good movie or a bad movie? That's a big question that we need to answer. So I'll tell you what, let's get Mr. Bo Ranzel in here to discuss this straight to streaming service superhero cinematic spectacular. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Samaritize and Nemesis diseases. It's Amazon Prime's 2020 original film, Samaritan. And welcome to Pick 6 Movies, I'm Chad Cooper, and I'm joined by the man who always engages me in an epic battle of good versus evil, the mostly benevolent Mr. Bo Ransdell. Bo, how are you doing today? I'm good. So, uh, Am I the Samaritan in this scenario? Maybe. Oh. I'll never tell. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Uh, I was going to say excited to talk about this movie. That that feels like overstating it. Um, I'm interested to have this conversation because I don't know anyone else who's seen this movie. This is not a terrible movie. It's not good. Don't get me wrong, but it's yeah. not. It's not unwatchable. And I think that's because Sylvester Stallone is such a good actor when he's playing this type of role. You know, kind of like stoic and quiet. This subdued bad. Badass. I mean, it's what made Rocky Balboa and John Rambo iconic characters. You clearly like this more than I did. I am a Stallone apologist. That's really what I like <laughs> about it. And, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. I don't know that there are many actors that are associated with film characters so directly. Stallone being John Rambo and Rocky Balboa, there really aren't that many. I, was, I thought maybe like Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones and Han Solo. I thought you were going to say Henry from Regarding Henry, but I get it. The only other one that I could think of, but this was just a voice actor, was H. John Benjamin mm -hmm. as Bob Belcher and Sterling Archer. But there really aren't that many actors that are so immediately associated with truly... I iconic film characters maybe the the guy from the mandalorian pedro pascal is getting there because he's got a couple of those under his belt but certainly not on the scale of like a stallone or something like that and schwarzenegger was always schwarzenegger in any movie he was it wasn't like he was the character in right. everything like he was kind of the same character just a riff on the same thing whereas you know john rambo and rocky balboa you can make the argument are very distinct characters and and he plays them differently and i i don't disagree with you i think 
Stallone. It, like in the introduction, you mentioned Copland, and he is phenomenally good in Copland, mm-hmm. uh, which is a very good movie. If listeners have not seen Copland, do yourself a favor. That's a quality film. Yeah. It's interesting to see him at this stage in his life where I know the introduction said that this was originally slated to go to theaters, which is hard for me to believe. <laughs> because watching it it feels so chintzy (laughs) i think it was originally slated to go to theaters when it was part of his production company Mm. and we'll make it and then i think covid came in and streaming services this and delays did that and it just is like hey here's what we're ultimately going to deliver this movie is cheap to a fault it is and i think that that's the downfall of a lot of these streaming service productions both long-form television series as as well as movies mm-hmm. is just it has watered down the production value so low that it's like how little can we give audiences and they'll still continue to give us eight to fifteen dollars a month <laughs> Yeah, especially if it's something that requires high production value in a world where, you know, people are really expecting a plus entertainment at times and you're giving them, you know, C minus at best. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the future looks like for streaming services and the, you know, the the productions that they're putting together. I hear, Chad, what they're going to do is that they're going to allow you to buy a package that's just a bunch of channels Mm -hmm. that you can have on your television. You pay a single monthly fee of, say, I don't know, 100-ish bucks. Right. And it's like a hundred different channels where almost anything is on at any given time. Well, I'll tell you the problem with that, Bo, is that in my house, the Wi-Fi gets a little spotty. Uh If they could figure out a way that they could take like an actual cable Mm -hmm. and connect that to my TV, I would be down for that. I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised by the way the technology is headed. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Yeah. One of the other things I wanted to mention about Stallone at the upfront here, he's one of the few remaining movie stars that can bring a level of star power. A legitimacy, yeah. But there's there's something about him. Like, I don't know that I would necessarily watch a movie like this if it starred Schwarzenegger. Clearly, it's not going to star Bruce Willis in his present day form. Mm -hmm. But I mentioned the new series that he has on Paramount Plus in the opening. And that's one of those things that it's like, oh, he's in this. I'll give it a chance. It's similar to Kevin Costner in Yellowstone, a show that I've heard very good things about, but will never find the time to watch. But there are certain, you know, you kind of anchor it with these actors. There just aren't big stars anymore, at least in my opinion, that can really pull that off. Like people don't go see a movie just because it has this person in it. Maybe George Clooney is one of the last of the real movie stars or certainly feels that way to me like Brad Pitt I I would place in that camp you know a younger generation than Stallone but like I would go see a movie that that had Brad Pitt in it just because Brad Pitt was in it yeah Uh, and I tend to like him somebody tried to argue with me the other day that Chris Pratt falls into that category and I was like I don't think so (laughs) I will avoid a movie if Chris Pratt is in it (laughs) I've been burned one too many times I saw that Tomorrow War piece of garbage or at least the first hour and 40 minutes of it before i hit the abort button on that thing i am a stallone apologist he has made a lot of really bad movies but i'll say this he always swings for the fences Mm -hmm. even with terrible movies like oscar or i'm trying to think a few others that didn't make it into the intro i mean there's just some just real misfires that he's put out into the world he kind of has fallen into that geezer pleaser category though with all those expendables movies and all those like lock up series like it feels like an easy way to cash in on wouldn't you though of course like i'm not blaming him for it make your money man i don't i have no problems with that but it waters down the star power like when you when you're on expendables 5 it's like all right well you're that's what you do now and you're not the same guy that made copland or even rocky balboa it is the fading of a star to some extent but i i agree that he is the best thing about this movie Mm -hmm. and obviously is putting in a performance of some type it's just (laughs) it's such a crap movie that it's hard for him to even on his broad shoulders 
years, it is tough for him to support this movie when everything else about it feels cheap and half-baked. Would you say that it's difficult for him to salvage this piece of trash? Oh. <laughs> oh, oh, oh how droll. So many Office fans. Yeah, it's... <laughs> Let's get into it. Come on. Here we go. Ready? So our movie starts off and we get an introduction that feels more like the opening cutscene of a video game. And I'll say this entire movie felt like a fantastic framework for a video game from the early 2000s. Like it sets up this narrative. We get a few twists. There's a big finale. It reminded me a lot of that PlayStation game Infamous Mm -hmm. where the main character had electricity powers and you could either be good or evil. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And there were, it felt like a lot of whiffs of that were wafting around this particular movie. And it's also worth noting that the CGI also looks like a mid 2000s video game yeah it's rough it really should have stuck with just the flat almost like flash animation style because when they do the cgi of actors it looks really really cheap so during this video game opening we hear our kid hero we are later going to learn his name is sam Mm -hmm. wait a minute sam sam ariton hmm that might be intentional (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Or it could just be stupid, Chad. That was one of those things where I was like, this screenplay needed another 30 minutes in the oven. I got a few ways they could have fixed this one real quick, and we'll we'll touch on that later. So... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> pick six movies we make your movie less worse <laughs> we hear sam say many years ago there was this awesome battle between samaritan and nemesis they were twin brothers they were sworn enemies and when they were kids they were like freaky strong and they hurt other kids so i guess they were bullies or something anyway the town they got real scared so they all got together and formed a mob and went over to their house and boarded <laughs> it up and they set the place on fire <laughs> yeah they freddy krueger them yeah <laughs> the whole town was just like man fuck these strong kids they're throwing people into lockers and whatnot let's when was the last time we burned down a house around here you know last weekend we hung all those cats in front Uh of that one house we tarted feathered the one guy we literally (laughs) rode someone out of town on a rail before my birthday we threw those ziploc bags full of piss at that one guy's house i remember that we ding dong ditched the mayor after we found out about that scandal you know it has been a long time since we just straight up burned down a house with children inside let's go back to the classics right right. murder children let's let's get rid of new coke and return to classic coke and just burn someone to death in their own home how about that sam goes on to say the parents died in the blaze but the kids they were unharmed because remember they were freaky strong and samaritan that was one of the kids he grew up to fight for justice and nemesis who sucks he just wanted to exact revenge for his parents death wait why did these two brothers become enemies i i can't really explain it and it kind of sounds like nemesis is doing what batman did batman was a good guy hold on wait you know what it's best if you don't ask questions about this movie at all (laughs) maybe it's best if i just skip to the hammer part (laughs) because nemesis who sucks made this awesome hammer where he poured all his hate and rage into this piece of metal or something again don't ask a whole lot of questions about that this hammer it's nothing like thor's hammer or steel's hammer or fix it felix hammer it's its own thing okay look pay attention to all this unnecessary detail to the plot of the movie but what's important is that it was the only thing that could kill samaritan who's awesome why is it the only thing that kills samaritan i told you don't ask any questions <laughs> all right so one day nemesis who sucks lured samaritan to this power plant and then chad we go from the crappy cgi to crappy like rotoscoping of this scene where it's live action but it's animated over the top of it kind of Uh and it looks like hot garbage this is samaritan showing up at this power plant to fight nemesis well sam tells us that he says samaritan showed up and nemesis he had his evil magic hammer and they had a battle but the power plant exploded and it killed samaritan and nemesis in the blast even though i just said that the only thing that could kill samaritan was the hammer that nemesis forged with all of his hate and rage you know because their parents died but look this backstory has a lot of holes in it okay all you need to know is that Samaritan and Nemesis are both dead or 
are they? A lot of people think that Samaritan, who is awesome, is still alive. And then we get the title, finally, against the background of this magic hammer, not to be confused with the intellectual <laughs> property of Thor's hammer. Or Army hammer. Right, the disgraced actor Army hammer. It would be better if he was the hammer used in this movie. I was in The Lone Ranger. Yeah, 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 we all saw your text, weirdo. The movie cuts to present day as the title overlay informs us, and we hear police sirens wailing in this city now i did like that in this movie it feels like we are in a comic book world it's a nice palate cleanser after the disgusting wad of a movie bright that we chewed on a couple of weeks ago because this whole town is positioned as a low-rent Gotham. Granite City is the name of our town and it, it has fallen on hard times chad as we see in literally every scene I thought it was Trash Lanta. <laughs> it might as well be. It's Garbageville. We see Sam, our hero kid from the movie's opening narration. And he's watching a YouTube video where Martin Starr is being interviewed about his book, Samaritan Lives. And the host on this YouTube channel says, uh, Sir, there's no way Samaritan faked his own death and is still alive. And Sam's like, that's bullcrap. Samaritan's 100% alive. His mom comes in and she says, Sam, I need some money for the bus. We're broke. And I'm irresponsible when it comes to our finances. Come on, give me some money so I can get to work where I might be a nurse or an orderly. I'm not a doctor. Look where we're living. And Sam's like, all right, hold on. Here's some money. All right. Mm, I love you. Goodbye. Don't, you know, don't let the other nurses pick on you, okay? Bye-bye, Mom. And as she leaves, she says, uh, Sam, uh, also take out the trash and clean up the house and cook dinner and balance our checkbook. Also, you were going to school, right? Oh, uh, yeah. I'm going to school. After she's gone, he actually does take out the trash. Of course, it's raining because, like you said, this sort of a low rent Gotham and somebody has spray painted a nemesis symbol like Samaritan nemesis both have symbols on their body armor that they wear but not that you would know that from watching any of this movie twice <laughs> Right. So <laughs> there's a Nemesis symbol spray painted on the garbage bin. And let me just say the Nemesis logo, as I remember it, it's kind of an N with a hammer somehow embedded in it. Yeah. But then the Samaritan logo really looks like the first half of a swastika. <laughs> <laughs> right it's a little dicey it's a less than sign stacked on top of a greater than sign Did that's right that? yeah yeah okay. yeah yeah that feels right and so it makes it makes like an s but really if you copy paste flip that bad boy like 90 degrees you're in trouble <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah when sam sees this non-swastika <laughs> this is bull crap it's a good thing i brought this spray paint in my pocket and so he yeah <laughs> Any kid that rolls around with a can of spray paint in his pocket. Yeah, you're in, you're in true hooligan territory at that point. But yeah, he spray paints a Samaritan logo. He's either tagging things or just huffing. Why can't it be both, Chad? <laughs> I mean, you're it's right. not like a parrot is supervising me like, hey, maybe you shouldn't huff spray paint. If you're huffing, you're not going out and artistically expressing your voice to the world for others to see. It's like, I mean, did you see what he spray painted? There's nothing artistic about what he's doing. <laughs> it is. I think it's just a reflex of like, Nemesis sucks. Here's Samaritan's <laughs> logo instead on top of it. <laughs> So he tags this dumpster with Samaritan's logo on top of Nemesis' logo. And then is disturbed from his graffiti by Sylvester Stallone showing up in this movie. Right. And so the kid hides, Sam hides, while Stallone is just like, hey, you better check and see if there's any good garbage in here today. And starts <laughs> rifling through the trash, grabs a fan, and takes off while Sam is like, Oh, wow, that guy sucks. He probably has to get all his food from the dumpster, too. The fan that he pulls out is one of those old-timey metal fans that has a metal frame around it. Yeah, it is the type of fan that the shit hit in Airplane. Yeah. My grandfather had one of those when I was a kid, but it didn't have the protective metal framework around it, and he would threaten <laughs> to put my fingers in it if I lied to him. He was a terrifying human being. <laughs> Tell me one lie, I'm gonna stick your hand in that fan. <laughs> That's not too 
far from the truth, man. That's terrible. But also, I, was it effective? Well, the reason it was effective was that my grandfather, on his left hand, his ring finger was cut off at the mid knuckle. Oh. And he told me that's what had happened to him. So I saw evidence of what occurred. All right. Well, uh, when you lied that they stuck your hand into a fan. But the reality of it was he was carrying a large piece of glass when he was younger in his life and someone dropped it one end of it probably him because he was an alcoholic mm. and uh the glass broke and severed his finger off well i i guess i'll have to wait till the diabetes just takes a toe <laughs> <laughs> and then i'll be like you know how i lost this toe that their fan definitely not little debbie snack cakes <laughs> So the next day we see Stallone and he's heading off to work at the garbage dump. And then we cut to Sam, who is in class. Good for you, Sam, for going to school. But he's not paying attention. <laughs> he's just drawing cartoon pictures of Samaritan in his notebook. Um, we come back over to Stallone at the dump and here he finds an old radio and he pulls it out. He's like, hey, look at this old radio. Maybe turn on this, this mayhem. His co-worker rightfully is like, what do you do with that piece of garbage? He's like, hey, I maybe fix it up, you know. And, hey, how about you back off? I don't want to say nothing, but I'm like freakishly strong. What'd you say? <laughs> nothing. We go back to Sam's apartment and he shows up there and finds an eviction notice on the door and there's a lock on the handle so he can't get into his apartment. So Sam leaves to head out onto the streets and maybe make money, you know, the hard way, one dollar at a time. <laughs> and then <laughs> <laughs> he feels Beats his Pac-Man fever addiction the hard way, one quarter at a time. We cut to Stallone. He's walking back to his apartment with that trash radio he found. And Sam says, hey, what's that thing in your hand? And Stallone says, oh, this is it's a radio. It's broken. It don't work. I like that watch on your wrist that you're wearing. Hey, I'm, I'm going to walk away all mysterious like now. And you're like, oh, so Stallone sees that this kid wears a wristwatch and it's broken. Mm -hmm. I'll bet that's going to be important. Right. Maybe it's from his father or something that we never learn about. So it's, he, he wisely leaves the scene and Sam's friend Jace shows up and is like, hey, Squirt, hey, I'm calling you Squirt, right? What you doing, Squirt? And Sam's like, hey, shut up. I hate when people call me Squirt. And his buddy Jace is like, hey. Maybe. Oh, well, how about if I call you Spanky? No, don't call me Spanky. How about Jerky? No. Well, these all seem to be applicable nicknames for you, Squirt. Stop it. It only happened once, okay? That you know about. And Jay says, like, hey, word on the street is you and your mom got thrown out of your apartment again. Do you need to make some money? Yeah, I need to make some money. I gotta get back in that apartment so that I can not get that nickname you gave me. So they go to this old building and start busting into the walls with a crowbar to steal the copper wire out of it. Jace boosts Sam up into a window and they just start ripping wire out of the walls. Uh -huh. And then we cut to Jace being pushed in a shopping cart full of stolen wire and aluminum cans mm -hmm. that I'm guessing that they ripped off from an orphanage that was collecting hands for a no kill puppy shelter or something. These two kids are pieces of garbage. Absolutely. Like Sam is one of the worst protagonists we've seen in a movie in some time. He is a real shit heel little kid. <laughs> He's walking around with spray paint in his pocket. <laughs> right. What we have seen of this kid so far is that he's going through abandoned buildings to steal whatever he can out of the place mm -hmm. and tagging dumpsters with graffiti of some low rent superhero that hasn't been around in 30 years. Yeah, he's not paying attention in school. No. he's Yeah, he's a real piece of garbage. And so on the way though, Jace is just going through <laughs> Sam's stuff and finds this <laughs> notebook that's got all these drawings of Samaritan on it and he's like hey you must really like Samaritan huh he's like yeah I do because he's awesome and he's like well you may want to keep that on the down low where we're going because you know Cyrus loves Nemesis and Sam's like what we're going to Cyrus's place that guy sucks we shouldn't go there but I mean we can get money for all this stuff we stole right all right I think I know what to do I'll keep quiet they arrive and they give their stolen goods to this guy who weighs him and he's like I'll give you $40 and they're like what that's bullshit give us more money than that and then about this time four or five Five cars that are suitable for a demolition derby they all show up and they appear to be painted with cans of spray paint themselves <laughs> yeah it's all primer gray 
gray. It is. Yeah. It's like a late model Oldsmobile. There's an El Camino. I think I saw a Daewoo or a K car in there. Like they were paid to take it off the lot for the movie. It's one of those things where you buy two, you get one free. Yeah. Like, hey, if you buy this Daiwu, we'll throw in this Monte Carlo. It runs kind of. These are all our villains. But the big one is Cyrus, who looks like a shitty Viking. He looks like Ewan McGregor. Yeah. If he had kind of a blonde mohawk and goatee. Yeah. And some crappy jailhouse tats. With him is Syl. She's the female of the group. Uh Uh-huh. There's this guy named Riza. He looks like the blue fairy turned Gonzo the Great into a real boy who then went on to get addicted (laughs) to methamphetamines. Yeah. If you want the, the human equivalent of it. Uh, he he looks like Jody High Roller, the uh, shitball rapper <laughs> that pops up. He's the basis of the James Franco character from Spring Breakers. He looks like the bizarro Seth Green. Yes, if if the Seth Green character from Can't Hardly Wait got worse dreads and went down a dark road, he's maybe three feet tall. I wasn't 100% certain that a puppeteer wasn't controlling all of his movements. He's got these shitty dreadlocks. His hair is kind of dyed blue. He's kind of Kid Kid Rock. (laughs) Rizzo walks over and he says, hello, it is I, the great Rizzo. I want to know what is up with these shitheads. And Sam and Jace are there and Jace is like, yeah, we're just selling this copper wire we stole. And uh, those cans we uh, poached from the orphans over by the no-kill puppy shelter. And Rizzo says, is that so? Well, if you want to make some real cash, we need someone to create a distraction while we pull off one of the greatest stunts of all time. And Sam says, hmm, that sounds pretty good. I'll do it. I need some cash. Jace is like, I don't want any part of this because Rizzo the great here looks like a real shit ball look i'll steal copper wire out of the no kill puppy shelter sure but i'm not doing whatever this kid is going to get you up to <laughs> creating a distraction at a bodega that my friend is a line i will not cross yeah that's my rubicon we cut over to stallone who is just sitting on a bus like hey, i'm just minding my own business here and this thug on a bus like official thug with puppy jacket is yelling at this old lady like hey old lady what are you looking at? <laughs> I'm just looking out the window, riding on the bus here. Let's keep it that way. I'm just, I, maybe I'll look out that window over there later. And Stallone is like, hey, maybe I should come out of retirement. Be, no, I better just sit here and watch this old lady get the what for from this thug. We come back to Sam and Rizzo and these two other nameless lackeys that are with them. And Rizzo says, I need you, Sam, to distract the owner of this bodega so that we can attempt to steal two owners. Oversized boxes filled with lottery tickets. And so Sam squirts a little hot sauce on his head to make it look like he's bleeding or something. But he runs inside and he gives it like full heart attack mode. He's like, it's the big one, Elizabeth. You gotta be home. (laughs) And then (laughs) the bodega owner runs out to help him. And Sam kind of crashes into some shelves. Again, he's a real piece of garbage. And then Rizzo and his crew run inside and steal two boxes that are blazonly marked lottery tickets. Uh huh. And then off they go. They take the boxes back to cyrus's lair and they hand him over to one of the main henchmen who is adam duritz the lead singer of 90s pop rock sensation band the counting crows and adam duritz <laughs> he opens up the box marked lottery tickets and it's full of bags of cool ranch doritos uh-huh. and then rizzo says what that's because this kid sam stole the wrong boxes and sam's like what this is bullshit I didn't steal those boxes. That was the distraction. My performance was immaculate. You hump stole the wrong boxes. This is where Cyrus enters the picture and is like, little Rizzo the Great says that you got the wrong boxes. Is this true, Samuel? And Sam is like, no, man, he sucks. I got the right boxes. They were marked lotto and everything. Ask Adam Duritz over there. And Adam Duritz is like, yeah. <laughs> 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 and so Cyrus is like, how old are you, young man? I'm 13. Why? What's it to you? Yeah, I got pubes and everything. You want to see them? I do not. But I like your attitude. So you're the youngest and the smallest. And you know, shit rolls downhill, Samuel. Is that what's happening here, Samuel? Is shit indeed rolling down the hill? And Sam doesn't say anything. Cyrus says, all of you here should be grateful for young Samuel. This young man knows when to keep his mouth shut. 
And then everybody kind of disperses and Syl walks over to Sam and she says, he likes you. He likes people with bite. And she goes, chomp. And yeah. she's a bad dude. Well, she tells him, you didn't rat. And that means something around here. Yeah. And then Cyrus notices uh, in Sam's spilled backpack, this notebook that's got all this Samaritan stuff scrawled all over it. You liked Samaritan. Is that true, young Samuel? Because he's the good guy me i prefer nemesis because he was the bad guy i even have an oversized tattoo of the nemesis logo on my left titty some people think <laughs> nemesis was indeed a bad guy because he hurt people samuel sometimes yes indeed he did but it's not if you hurt people it's who you hurt samuel someone around here write that down that sounded important. I want to put that in my memoirs. Oh, better yet, I shall make it the subject line of my latest substack. Everyone here, you're all subscribed to my substack? Yes. My Patreon? Yes. Hmm? Lots of pictures of my feet for a nominal price, everyone. I have a lot of revenue streams to support my evil doings. Nemesis always punched up. Samaritan was just a cop to protect the rich. Then he pulls out this wad of cash and peels off a hundred and says, Samuel, this is what you did today. And then he peels off a couple more and hands it over and says, this is for what you will do for me in the future. <laughs> Sam's like, yoink! Thanks a lot, sucker! I'm out of here! <laughs> right? So he goes <laughs> home where his mom is arguing with this landlord over the eviction notice, and she doesn't have a leg to stand on. Sam just walks up and he's like, take the hundred, get yourself something pretty, open the door. The adults have shown up to take care of the situation, mom. And the landlord's like, hey, this isn't personal, it's just, you know, you haven't paid rent in three months? And she's like, <laughs> how dare you lock me and my child out of this place that we do not pay for? We have squatter's rights, probably. I'm going to law school in addition to this vague nursing job that I have. So they finally get inside and... And she sees that there's stuff on Sam's face. And she says, hey, what is all this on, uh, this crap on your face? And he's like, shut up. This is just hot sauce. And, like I slipped in a convenience store and I broke a bunch of hot sauce bottles and I got some on me. And the owner gave me some money to keep quiet about the accident because he didn't want to pay for another slip and fall. So are we cool? Sam, what have I always told you? Uh, I need to get more money to pay for our stuff. Wait, that's not it. Uh, what is it you always say? Always carry spray paint? That's not it. The decisions you make add up. Um, Mom, I don't really even know what that means, because quite honestly, you're terrible at math. With great spray paint comes great responsibility. Did you say that one time? Or <laughs> hey, if you see an abandoned house, check it for copper wire. If you smell something, say something. Is that you? <laughs> He who smelt it, dealt it. You told me that one time. The pickers, the liquor. What are you doing in the bathroom all the time? <laughs> Give someone else a chance. Uh, she's like, hey, I'm not buying any of this. You you clearly did not get this money from a convenience store guy. And Sam says, right, again, this is a fair point on Sam's count. He's like, yeah, well, you didn't ask any questions before you took the money, huh? And she, he's like, well, you know, this is a real beggars and choosers scenario, so maybe not. We cut back to the warehouse where Counting Crows lead singer Adam Duritz. He opens up this metallic briefcase and he says, I've been hanging around this case of grenades. I've been hanging around these explosives way too long. And Cyrus says, indeed, Adam Duritz lead singer of the counting crows our plan is in motion it shall take place on the morrow yeah <laughs> <laughs> we see sam walking out on the streets and he goes past this arcade where uh rizzo the great and his two thugs they see sam so rizzo says it is sam for my next amazing feat we will get this boy and we shall extract the money that he cost me and rizzo and his thugs they chase after sam who runs down the street and he almost gets hit by a bus but it slams on its brakes and wouldn't you know it Bo? inside the bus is sylvester stallone going for a ride watching old ladies get yelled at by real thugs hey oh look that kid's being chased by a bunch of other little kids <laughs> Sam dashes around, he climbs a fence, Rizzo and his two thugs are hot on his tail, and finally they catch up to him, and Rizzo just clocks Sam in the head with his yeah. fist. It was a good solid punch. And Rizzo says, for my next amazing feat, I, the great Rizzo, am going to beat Sam to death. <laughs> right this kid really does get the shit kicked out of him in this movie and that's maybe the best thing about it it is soprano style beatdown. yeah and then wouldn't you know it stallone shows up and starts throwing these little kids around like they're <laughs> pool noodles he judo chops one in the neck 
And then the great Rizzo is like, for my next trick, I will use this knife to stab him. But Stallone grabs his knife and is like, hey, what if I just squeeze it real hard and bend it until it doesn't work as good no more? <laughs> then, with all the kids just cast to the winds, Stallone takes off. Sam pulls himself finally off of the ground and is like, well, that guy didn't suck at all. Wait, who do I know that doesn't suck? Oh, Samaritan. I wonder if that old guy who likes to steal fans and old radios is Samaritan. Oh, look at this knife. He crushed it like a grape. He doesn't suck at all. He does the opposite of suck. What is the opposite of suck? He's awesome. And <laughs> then he looks over and as fate would have it, this is yet another dumpster that he has tagged with the Samaritan symbol on it. And so he runs home and does a real rear window yeah. to look at Stallone across you know, the apartment block across the courtyard at Stallone through his window. And Stallone has all these scars on his back. Like, what was the name of that uh, Mel Gibson movie? Is it The Man Without a Face? The Man with No Face, yeah. Or Without a Face, whatever. But he's got them kind of scars on his back. And, of, of course, Sam is like, wait a second, how can you get scars? Well, there's glass <laughs> and barbed wire and fire. Wait a second. Samaritan was at that big fiery explosion. I think I'm on to something. <laughs> Meanwhile, we cut over st st uh, to Stallone, who's just fixing this radio. Like, hey, oh, maybe I can get some AM radio. You know, I really like uh, the talk radio and they, you know, tell us all about how there's something in the vaccines and little computer <laughs> chips and whatnot. And Sam comes up to his door. At first, I thought, well, he's going to knock on the door and say, like, I know who you are. But instead, he just reads the name <laughs> off the door, mm -hmm. which is very cleverly, hey, my name's Joe Smith. That's a little obvious. Maybe uh, John Doe. Yeah, I just go by Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> and so Sam goes back to his room where he opens his closet door and he's got this running list of potential Samaritans uh -huh. that are crossed out. And, you know, it's like that guy who ran from a dog one time and stuff like that. And he <laughs> adds Joe Smith to the name of his potential Samaritan suspects. But it's not just like three or four. Like there's maybe 25 or 30 suspects that he's gone through. It's a lot. It's real obsessive. Yeah. The movie then cuts to a stolen police van that's being driven by our movie's bad guys. And inside the back of the van uh, is Cyrus. And he's wearing what I assume was stolen tactical gear. And he's getting it all tucked in by Syl because she wants him to look nice for their little mission. Uh -huh. And the crew arrives at the evidence room at a police station. And the officer on duty says, sorry, folks, evidence room's closed. Moose out front should have told you that. And Cyrus <laughs> says, my, my good man, what I have in my possession is a blackout bomb. It plays havoc on electronics. Here, let me drop it into this sliding drawer for you to examine. <laughs> And he tosses this little bomb in. It scooches over to the other side and explodes. Then all of our bad guys break into this evidence room where they find boxes containing the helmet for both Nemesis and Samaritan. And then ultimately they find the hammer that belonged to Nemesis. What does this hammer do exactly, Bo? We never find out. Apparently... It's not just freakish strength that exists in this, this world because this hammer is straight up magic. Maybe. I, there's so much that really feels like either was left on the editing room for or was just never a consideration. It's like, he's just got a magic hammer. It's like, like it's shocking we don't see a dragon flying through the sky at some point. <laughs> a la Bride of just like, wait a second, there are dragons too? There's magic hammers and dragons and freakishly strong people. Gotcha. Cyrus says, with this magic hammer, I will finish what Nemesis started. What did he start? Don't ask questions. Uh, that will only help to make this movie more understandable. Let's just keep the fun rolling along. It's fun to not know things sometimes. I like surprises. And there's some cutting back and forth between Stallone working at his, you know, electronics workbench. What was this? What does this part of radio do? Oh! Ooh, got zapped. Don't do that Ooh. again, Sly. Yeah, that's the shock Stallone part of the radio. I don't know why they even include those in these radios. Wait, 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 that looks tasty. Let me taste that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> but we're cutting back and forth between him as thunder is peeling off in the distance and cyrus using this hammer to like bang down doors and stuff yeah and he, he there's like a great disturbance in the force moment totally then we have a scene with Sam going to Martin Starr's bookstore, and as soon as he sees him, he's like, oh no, you better get out of here, kid. I like that to give Martin Starr's character depth, they just give him a hairless cat. Right. Like, this guy's a real eclectic weirdo. He's like, look, get out of here, kid. You keep coming in here all the time, and I'm sick and tired of all your suspects versus Samaritan. But this time Sam comes in and he says, hey, I found the Samaritan. Look, this is, I know, like the 30th time I've been here, but look, I've really found him. His name is Sylvester Stallone. I saw him half naked from the waist up from my apartment. He also beat up this blue daredevil puppet uh, that works as a plumber and was popular in the 70s and 80s, as well as a couple of kids. It was like Billy Bob Thornton in Bad Santa. He just beat the shit out of children. And actually, one of the better lines of the movie and accurate is when Martin Starr is like, so your evidence is that he just beat up a bunch of children? Yes! <laughs> All right. He's Samaritan, you know, the good guy. Of course he would. Wait a minute. That doesn't square. You know what? Forget that part. All right. He thought they were little people. He thought they were adults. He didn't know they were kids. Yeah, that makes sense. Look, kid, why don't you buy one of my books and I'll show you something. Here's another pamphlet on confirmation bias. I think that's what you're dealing with right now, kid. So he takes him to the back of this bookstore, which is twice as big as the front of the bookstore for some reason. I think he might live there. <laughs> it's basically the the Zed Mart of bookstores. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he shows him this wall of like beautiful mind yarn and pictures that he has that are all these facts and sightings of Samaritan. And he shows Sam a picture of the nemesis hammer and says, well, this was found at the death site. This hammer was forged from the hatred that Nemesis had for his brother Samaritan. And Sam's like, no shit. Did you not see the start of the movie? I went over all this. There was a cartoon that played in the background, some shitty computer animation, and they're twins. We got all this. You don't need to explain it. And Martin Starr is like, look, this just doesn't prove anything, even with your bent up knife. So how about you get out of here, Tim? I have a theory. Nemesis wanted to start a fire at the power plant to throw the whole city into anarchy, and he lured Samaritan into his trap. Ultimately, it was his own hatred that destroyed him. That's what I said at the start of the movie, and I didn't even read your stupid book. Look, I know who Samaritan is, all right? It's Sylvester Stallone. He's a garbage man. He lives in the building across the street from me. I spy on him with my binoculars. After he leaves Martin Starr's joint, Sam then, the next morning watches Stallone leave for work, he thinks. And Stallone sees him staring down from his window and is like, hey, I see you watching, a-hole. All right. I, I really want to put a hard pause on our conversation for a moment. Because it was at this exact moment, Bo, that I thought, why would Samaritan, our movie's good guy, call a child an a-hole? And I was like, either one... He's so, you know, worn down by life and the tragic burned up death of his mom and dad and his brother that, you know, he's just this bitter old man. Or number two, he's not Samaritan. He is quite possibly Nemesis. Now, yes. I did not call that he was Nemesis. I was just questioning his motives and kind of what the movie was kind of presenting to us. I want to go ahead and say right now. Spoiler, Stallone is not Samaritan. He is, in fact, Nemesis, which we will find out at the very tail end of Act 3. I think this mm -hmm. is important as we go through this conversation to just cut through all the bullshit. Yeah. And this was the same scene. Like, you might have caught this a, a hair earlier than I did, but the, in the same scene. Because what happens is Sam, once Stallone has gone to work pushes a dumpster the the dumpster is the real <laughs> star of the movie if you ask me it's got more costume changes it has more utility it's featured more prominently and getting shit done uh, yeah it's got a character arc and and so sam <laughs> uses the dumpster to climb into stallone's apartment 
Time for a little B and E. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, breaking into buildings is old hat for this character at this point. It, it's a shocking he didn't steal the copper out of the walls while he was there. That young man across the courtyard is climbing up the building again. Oh, I guess another apartment has been vacated. <laughs> that means all the cop is gone again. <laughs> he goes through Stallone's apartment. He finds a freezer full of Edie's ice cream. Yes. Uh, who, you know, is prominently featured for their kind financial consideration in the making of this movie. <laughs> I, th- I think they just donated free ice cream. And, you know, he sees the workbench that Stallone uses to fix all his crap. And then he goes into his closet and high up on the top shelf, he finds an album of clippings of Samaritan's good deeds and like the story of the mob burning down the house and <laughs> also Samaritan like saving people on a train and whatnot. And so he's like, hey, this thing's awesome. I should steal it. And so he does. He just, he leaves a couple of of breadcrumb articles laying on the floor and then takes off it's real sloppy thievery he wanted to get caught Bo. right he wa- i want someone to stop me why does this movie do such a piss poor job establishing how samaritan and nemesis existed in the world before they were gone because they it almost feels like the movie needs a like a backstory either to the backstory or within the backstory like i get that they were kids and their parents died then they grew up and then they fought and they died like it feels like there's a huge chapter of the samaritan nemesis story that is notably absent yeah and like and then when they died it's like oh we found a hammer and we found their metal skull caps but they didn't find any bodies or did they find a body you could fix this movie real easily where when they found a body they found one body and And that body had Nemesis' helmet and has the hammer, right? So they're like, oh, Nemesis died, but we only found Samaritan's helmet. We didn't find Samaritan's body. Then we'll talk about this in a minute. When they detail out their final epic battle, you you do a little switcheroo of who's wearing what and why. And then because they're twins, you can't tell the difference between them. That helps to establish that Samaritan may be alive and that everyone knows Nemesis is dead. But they don't do any of that. They do not. There is a backstory that you could do that would be kind of interesting and would inform the characters a little bit better. But I think the the problem is that they want to do this hokey reveal at the end. And so that is more front of mind for the script than it is to actually describe the relationship between these brothers. Also, get rid of all the computer animation or excuse me, get rid of all of the animated sequences at the beginning, middle and end. Start with the kid, have him be obsessed and then have his sort of detective work reveal the story to us. I don't think we need to see it in cartoon form. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, Just anything that doesn't involve that cartoon stuff that looks like garbage. Um, But this was the point where I was like, in fact, I texted you. Yeah. At this point in the movie and was like, oh, okay, so he's Nemesis, right? Got it. Okay. I didn't call that he was Nemesis. When this happened, I was like, wait a minute, is either he's just a damaged version of Samaritan or he might be Nemesis. And this was the moment that I thought, I was like, oh, they're setting up like a twist. Like there's going to be more to, to what's going on than what's going on. Yeah. I, but I didn't know that explicitly. Back to our movie. Uh, after Stallone calls this kid an a-hole. And Counting Crows frontman Adam Duritz. He's sitting in the front seat of a car with the great Rizzo. Adam Duritz says, come on Rizzo, what's the problem, baby? What's the problem? I don't know. Well, maybe you're a jerk, jerk. Think about it every time you light a Cyrus. Come on, come on. You're a little bastard. Come on, come on. Still we'll follow after. Come on, come on. Because everybody's after us. We're accidentally cousins. Like, what? Like, Rizzo and this guy are cousins now? As they're driving around, Rizzo the Great is like, and now I present to you, (laughs) Sylvester Stallone walking down the road. That's the guy that beat the crap out of a bunch of kids. (laughs) Camilla, bring me my umbrella. It's still raining outside. And so we follow Stallone back to the apartments where he sees this dumpster star of the movie pushed under his window. Hey, Dumpy, what are you doing over there? Wait a minute. That wasn't there this morning. Dumpy, what you got inside you today? Hey, Sly, look inside me. There's a hobo. Maybe you could take him up to your apartment and fix him up. I think he's an alcoholic and maybe schizophrenic. 
Oh, this homeless person is just the kind of thing you're looking for. Sam, meanwhile, is putting the album that he stole under his bed, like under the mattress. Hold on, let me move my uh, other materials to the side. Hello, <laughs> ladies. I got a new friend for you, the Samaritan. Yink, yink. Copper's not the only thing you find in abandoned buildings. <laughs> <laughs> or elevators <laughs> and so stallone goes home to see a bunch of loose clippings laying on the floor he's like hey wait a second i just vacuumed i didn't leave a bunch of newspaper on the carpet oh wait a second those clippings came from my special album that no one's supposed to see even though it's in a super special album that just dares you to look inside <laughs> and, and i hid it in a place where nobody would look for something you're trying to find that you hide you know the top shelf of a closet Right. Well, he immediately goes to Sam's apartment because he's like, oh, I know who, who stole this. Is that kid Sam? So he goes over and bangs on the door and he says, your kid took some valuable of mine. Look, my name is Sylvester. Uh, I mean, John Doe. I mean, Joe Smith. Uh, your kid's got my scrapbook it's full of memories and things that remind me of special moments like oh, birthday cards. There's a note for some flowers I got one year. Some letters from friends. Uh, pressed flower. Found the park. Lock of hair I took from a lover. She slept. Um, nude photos of the same lover I took while she slept. Pictures of me dressed up in my nemesis. I mean, my Samaritan. I mean, my dressed up for Halloween. Just need to get that book back. Couple of uh, receipts from when I went to uh, the movies and saw some pretty good movies. Uh, Doctor Strange and uh, Thor The Dark World. I've got some torn uh, concert ticket stubs. Uh, foreigner. Uh, Survivor. Fog hat. Journey. Rare golden earring. Double bill of uh, Mojo Nixon and They Might Be Giants. One time. <laughs> that was a good uh, show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, spoken word from Jello Biafra from Dead Kennedys. <laughs> uh, Violent Femmes all acoustic show. Uh, <laughs> Fish, a lot of fish in there. Big fish head. Counting crows uh, and black crows together is an all crow show. Yeah, the Cheryl Crow opened for him on that concert. <laughs> so, but then Sam's like, hey, uh, look, uh, I'm really sorry that I stole your special album. You don't suck. And his mother's like, don't you have anything else you want to say to him? And he's like, uh, I'm a fan. That's what I stole from you. That sounds like a stalker. Also, is it true that if I kill you and wear your skin, I become you? Can I have a bite off of one of your toenails? Let's see what that does to me, just as a starter. And so his mom, like, you know, Stallone is taken off, and his mom chases him down the hall, and he's like, look, he's not a bad kid, despite all evidence to the contrary, <laughs> in everything he says and does, and, and frankly, the way he smells, he is actually a pretty good kid and so like hey you no know, i'm done you know he leans back in and he's like hey sam you know you lucky you have such a great mom because yeah. like she didn't get burned up in no fires or nothing <laughs> and i'm just saying you're very lucky let me ask you at any point in this movie did you think that sam was going to be the son of samaritan and that cyrus would be the kid of nemesis what did that cross your mind at all <laughs> no <laughs> i did because <laughs> well, you're just inventing other movies to watch which is understandable when you're watching this movie like i had a whole movie i wanted to watch about uh, a city filled with mice and how that they, they had invented their own culture in the wake of some sort of human apocalypse but uh that doesn't, doesn't happen in this movie either uh, but Sam, meanwhile, is just sitting around throwing rotten cabbage or something <laughs> at that old dumpy that we tagged. Why are you picking on me? I helped you break into all these buildings, Sam. Shut up, dumpy. Uh, also, Sam, you really might ought to call the cops. There are a couple of dead babies inside me today. One of them even has a hypodermic still in it. And so Stallone is wandering <laughs> by and Sam is like, hey, wait a second. <laughs> You don't suck, and that leads me to believe that you're Samaritan. Are you Samaritan? And Stallone's like, hey, look, Samaritan's dead, and I'm not even telling a lie because I'm really nemesis, but you'll find that out later in the movie. And Sam is like, well, how come you got that scrapbook full of Samaritan stuff? And Stallone's like, well, like you said, you know, I'm kind of a fan too, and, you know, maybe I just miss my brother. I mean, nothing. And then... <laughs> 
<laughs> Stallone just wanders into the street, and there's a real Meet Joe Black here. It is. <laughs> where he's like, hey, kid, how about you just leave me alone? And then this car, driven by Counting Crows lead singer Adam Duritz and Rizzo the Great, rams into Stallone full speed in one of these primer gray Monte Carlos. Yes. Sending him ass over tea kettle. If anyone has ever gone ass over tea kettle, it's Sylvester Stallone in this movie. And then he just lands on the ground in this crumpled mass of a jagged body laying in the street. And we hear Rizzo the Great go, ta-da! <laughs> and then they just drive off. You can hear Dad of Dirt. He's like, it's a long December and there's reason to believe we just killed Sly Stallone's old grumpy ass. Yeah. <laughs> and so Stallone, meanwhile, lying on the ground, like uh, Sam rushes over, is like, "Oh my God, you're dead, old man." <laughs> <laughs> that sucks. I've seen old men before, and their bodies are not supposed to bend like that. Look at your face. It's all swolled up and covered in red puffy blood marks. Stallone just starts kicking his arms and legs out beside him, fixing his bones through his super strength or whatever. And the music sounds a little bit like the opening of Home Alone. It's all magical. It's like, but it up, bum, bum, crack, crack, bum, it up, bum, <laughs> snap. Do, 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 do. Ooh, that hurts. Baba, what's going on here? There is a good laugh here where Sam is, uh, like, after he's, like, working out all of his broken bones, Sam's like, oh my god, are you okay? And Sloan goes, fuck no. <laughs> Which is pretty funny. <laughs> it's the one F-bomb of the movie, and it's well-placed. As Stallone stands up, he kind of looks like the Scarecrow in The Wizard of Oz learning to walk. He's all wobbly-legged, and he's, like, snapping his ankle back into place. Right, and he's like, I need to get some water. They go back to Stallone's apartment where Stallone strips naked and gets into Hello. a shower with the door open. <laughs> because why wouldn't you in front of a young boy? Sam's like, hey, it doesn't matter to me. It's, you got nothing I haven't seen before. I'm staring at you through the window all day long. Are those shrunken testicles because of all the steroids <laughs> or what? Stallone hobbles over to the shower and his body is already steaming a bit but when he gets in the shower and turns on the water it just explodes with steam it's like pouring water on the pumice stones in a sauna or something yeah after he steams in the shower for a minute he gets out and he's eating a bunch of ice cream Sam is like hey how come you gotta eat all that ice cream and can I have some and he's like well I gotta eat all this because it helps my body cool down that sounds pretty cool why and he's like well, you know anything about nuclear fission or cellular thermodynamics? I didn't think so because you're a stupid kid, so shut up. The long and short of it is, if I don't cool down after I do super stuff, my heart just explodes. Based on what? Is he just guessing? It, it's a fine question. Like, <laughs> were their parents scientists? Is this how this happened? Also, if you're trying to provide this scientific explanation of his super strength, then what about the magic hammer? Like, those two things don't sit well beside each other, no. where there is a scientific genetic reason for his superpowers, plus, oh, there's also magic. Sam just ignores this, because he realizes asking questions only get him in trouble. Instead, Sam says, uh, you know, you saved my dad one time. Um, he used to boost cars, and one night you caught him, and instead of taking him to jail, you just talked to him, but then he died. Wait, my story doesn't make sense. How did you save my dad by not taking him to jail for stealing a car? Yeah, and then he just died some other way. <laughs> it's it, right, it's a real mess. Like again, the script needed 350 for 1 hour and it was pulled out at 35 minutes. <laughs> We cut to Syl and Cyrus, and they're sitting in the back of a different van with Counting Crows lead senior Adam Duritz uh, in the driver's seat and a nameless henchman uh, in the front passenger seat. And Cyrus holds up one of those electronic grenades they had earlier, and he says, Sylvia, let's see if we can wake these people up. Well, they pull over the van, and one of the henchmen tosses the electric grenade into a manhole, which I don't think he was supposed to do, because he goes, <laughs> uh, my bad, boss. And I was like, what? But then the grenade goes off, and all the electricity on this block shuts off. 
And then Cyrus gets out of the van and it's night and it's real dark. And he straps on the Nemesis helmet that they stole from the evidence room at the police station. And he jumps up on the back of this tow truck. And then all the people who live in this neighborhood, they stagger out of their apartments and they look pretty passive to me because I would expect there to be a lot of what the fuck happened to the internet and the power like, mm-hmm. I know how the savages in my house react when these two things go out, and it is not agreeable. <laughs> right. Everybody just kind of gathers around this tow truck, all 30 people on this block. And Cyrus then mounts the back of this tow truck with his nemesis mask and the hammer, and he says, Listen, people, nemesis is back to help all, all of the helpless. And while he's giving this speech about how we're taking back the night in the street and all that kind of stuff... The gang members are going around like firing t-shirt cannons with the Nemesis logo and stuff on it. Some Nemesis koozies. They're handing out ski masks Uh, that are shittily decorated with the Nemesis face on it, which isn't really a face. It's just sort of like white paint. And they're like, and one for you and one for you. Do you, Two for you? What size? I've got medium and large. Oh, I really need a small because of Medium that. runs large. Large is like an extra large. You know what? Try medium. If it doesn't work, come back. Okay? Who needs a mask? I got masks. Funk. I got a shirt. Oh, look at that guy. He knows how it's done. And this is where it reminded me most of one of those CW superhero shows that are really done on the cheap, and but they try to do these big crowd scenes, and the crowd is you know, 30 people like we see here. And it's Cyrus on the back giving this big bloviating speech about people of Trash Lanta. I will put the power back into your hands. That is all of you who live paycheck to paycheck eating food featured on dollar menus. It is time to take back what is yours. The revolution starts now. And then yells, go into the night, my children. Take back what is yours. Uh, I've got a question. Is the internet going to be back on soon? Someone stifled that young man. Uh, Question in the back. Uh, When you say go, what are we supposed to do after that? Go! (laughs) Exactly. Go into the night. Take back what is yours. Um, how do we take back what's ours? Exactly. Take it back, my children of the night. Nemesis has returned. But everybody seems on board with it, mostly, I think, because they got free t-shirts and ski masks out of the deal. They basically think this is going to be an, like an impromptu improv everywhere. A flash mob about a decade and a half too late. Somebody starts playing Thriller. Are we going to put this on YouTube? Well, we can't. The internet's out. God damn it. <laughs> ah, stupid nemesis. I mean, I mean, all hail nemesis. Wait, did he cause this problem? I think he did. So why are we listening to him? I don't know, because we're mindless idiots? Oh, yeah. He did have those grenades. What grenades? Did you see a grenade? I saw a grenade. Somebody threw a grenade down the sewers. And he's probably got more of those, so... (laughs) Better do what he says. I mean... (laughs) Yeah. Also, you know, everything's so crap in this city already. Maybe, like, let's make it even worse (laughs) and see if we can drive it to rock bottom so we can, you know, get that bounce up that we've all been waiting for. Here's an alternative. What if we start to clean the place up? We quit breaking windows and we start repairing them. Eh, I'm I'm sticking with the rock bottom plan. Like, let's break all of the windows and then we'll start repairing them. Yeah, but if we clean things up, our property values would go up. Uh, Better jobs are coming to the neighborhood. Nobody's buying anything in trash land. You saw the bottom fell out of the housing market. <laughs> like, right around the time we had two super heroic brothers fighting all the time. The power grid infrastructure in Trash Lanta is very fragile. One fire 25 years ago. Look where we are today. Look, look, look how many people are homeless here. Now, is that Nemesis's fault? No, but it's certainly not you know cleaned up because of nemesis and his grenades and uh, i mean yes the homeless people now have new shirts but that's as far as we've gotten in solving this problem you know what uh nemesis did propose that we make it illegal to to sleep on public grounds so that should help (laughs) we cut to stallone and he's sleeping in his bed and he's fully clothed he's got socks and shoes and his knit cap and all too much Edie's ice cream i guess about and Mm -hmm. he's having a nightmare about the last time that Samaritan and Nemesis did battle, 
but that really doesn't go anywhere. We do see the two of them fighting atop the power building and it's all on fire and the hammer gets tossed aside and then one of these two pick it up. It's impossible to distinguish Samaritan from Nemesis in these flashback fight scenes unless they turn around and show you the sloppily painted logos on their chests. But Stallone just pops up with a classic, no, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I can't escape my past. And we cut over to Sam, who's just watching news reports of homelessness and riots in the street. Last night, guys dressed up like nemesis. They held a rally and triggered a night long of looting and power went out. And what? Hold on. Someone's telling me unemployment and poverty are on the rise. It's only a matter of time before the city implodes. Sam also sees Stallone going to work and he runs out to follow him. He is chasing him through the streets of Trashlana. And Stallone's like, hey, I watch this. I'm going to hide on this kid, jump out and scare him. And so he does. He hides around a quarter. And when Sam goes by, he comes out and he's like, hey, how come you follow me all the time? I bet you go home. What I got to do to make you quit following me? Throw you under a bus? He does threaten to throw him under a bus, which is pretty good. The Samaritan would never do that. That sounds like something that shitbag Nemesis would do. Nemesis sucks. Samaritan rules. And you're Samaritan. Hey, you want to be my new dad? Yeah, I, let me just correct you on a couple of points. I mean, like, Nemesis was just kind of misunderstood. He wasn't the worst guy in the world. Tell you what, I'll, I'm about to go take this camera I fixed to a pawn shop. You, you can tag along if you want. You got your own bus fare? Because, look, I, I ain't got that much money, all right? I took some more copper out of a building. I got all kinds of bus fare. <laughs> oh. Edie's ice cream, that's premium product. It costs a lot of money. Huh? All my money be paying for you right on the bus down the pawn shop. Maybe I get some money, pawn shop. I can pay for you right back, but not to do the pawn shop. So anyway, while they're on the bus, Sam is like, "Hey, if if you're a superhero, how come you don't do more awesome stuff instead of sitting around your apartment sucking all the time?" He's like, "You know, I'm I'm a troglodyte. You know what that is? Is a, a word that means a cave dweller. I'm like I'm alone and happy." And he's like, <laughs> "I don't think that's true. Here's the pawn shop." Let's go in there and steal some stuff. I bet they've got a lot of copper in the pawn shop. I've got a lot of experience creating a distraction. Do you have a pack of hot sauce? I'll put it on my head. You can steal whatever you want. Yeah, about you stay outside. I'm going to go into the pawn shop and take care of business. As they're going into the pawn shop, a guy bumps into Stallone. It's a real shoulder check. And Stallone looks at him like he's about to pick up this guy and crumple him into a ball. It's a pretty good scene in a movie that's not very good. Because you see Stallone control his rage. And I really thought, I was like, oh, he's going to let this fly later. Which he does, but it doesn't get to that moment of, like, just let it loose. To prevent the kid from following him in, Stallone just rips off the door handle. I thought he ripped the door handle off because he was so pissed off that that guy shoulder checked it. I, I think it's a little above. Both. Okay. <laughs> Seems a bit excessive to prevent the kid from coming in, but maybe, yeah, I, I can see where you're coming from. Anyway, he has a little back and forth with the guy who runs the pawn shop, mostly about the fact that the guy just ripped the handle off the door. <laughs> what the fuck did you just do? <laughs> it just comes off. You know, sometimes the door handles rip off of you. Hey, give me some money for this camera. I'll give you 25 Good, Give me 50 I'll take a picture with it. Come on. And these are the moments in Stallone movies that just make me love him as an actor. He can be so charming and likable. And I, I wish there was more of this in this movie, which I think you could have done with the character he's playing. They just, they just don't do it. Yeah, it is a nice moment. Like, hey, I'll take a picture with you. Um, give me 50 bucks. I mean, again, it's like him talking about his turtles in Rocky. Right. Or him working the crowd in the restaurant in Rocky Balboa, you know? Like I said, I'm a Stallone apologist. I enjoy him greatly. On their way out, though, they see a bunch of looters running across the street. And Stallone says, look, that's what happens when you get a bunch of genetic freaks to fix your problems instead of you fixing the problem. Because if you don't fix the problem, the problem fixes you or something. And you're like, what? <laughs> I don't know that any of that makes sense in in that order. Yeah, his character does not give a lot of sound advice at all in this movie. No, but Sam is asking him like, hey, are you still super strong? And he's like, well, I'm not as strong as I used to be because, you know, you got to care about stuff to be real strong. I stopped caring a long time ago. I I, I couldn't pick up that boulder. I could pick up that other smaller boulder over there. <laughs> I could pick up a smaller one, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's a joke for four people who know that particular sketch from Saturday Night Live. <laughs> but so th- he falls around apparently all day because it's night by the time they get back to the apartments. Well, they walked home, right? They didn't take the bus. 
Yeah, because they didn't have any get money. As much he had money to pay for that door. <laughs> yeah, and Stallone says, like, look, I told you way too much. And Sam's like, no, you can trust me. I don't suck. Hey, can I ask you a question? Do you ever get scared or anything? And Stallone's like, yeah, sure, I get scared. And, you know, it happens all the time. Just, you, just birds like you. I don't like to fight nobody. When I get scared, the first thing I do is freeze up or just run away. And Stallone says, hey, that's, that's pretty smart, running away like a coward. You know, do you scream, please don't hurt me when you run away? Because that's the mark of bravery, all right? Now, uh, hey, w- won't you give me the watch on your wrist? I'll try to fix it. Uh, by the way, is there a backstory of that broken watch you wear? You know what? Forget about it. I'm just, you know, f- pretend I didn't even ask the question because it don't matter in the movie. How about I just assume, you know, that like that came from your dad or something and we'll just leave it at that. How about that? Oh, th- oh this old thing? I stole it from that apartment over there. I think it makes me look badass. I found it in the in the when I was stealing wires out of there, I found it in the wall. It was actually around the wrist of a corpse that I found inside Dumpy one day. He's right. He also took the man's shoes. That's bad luck, Samuel. I've told you that before. I do like the fact that Salone here says like fighting people in the street is for fools. You know, you fight somebody that you don't care about you, what's the point? You know, it's probably the smartest thing he says. Well, once upon a time, I knew this guy, and he was fighting this other guy, and uh, he, you know, he didn't like this other guy. They were, you know, you know, they knew him a long time, and uh, the other guy died. And now the guy who didn't die, he's, you know, he's kind of racked with guilt. You know, like, it, it could be the basis of a movie or something, the way that, you know, he has to kind of hide from the world and has to think every day about all the bad stuff he did and maybe he tries to do good stuff now. You get in a fight like that, Sam, it ends one two ways. You're dead or crippling depression. Would you pick, all right? Because you don't fight in the street. You What do you do? You run away and you scream, don't hurt me, all right? <laughs> and if they do get on top of you, Piss your pants. Shit yourself. What I do is I like to act just totally crazy. Like I start ripping out my own hair and trying to poop in my <laughs> hand, throw it out. Because <laughs> if you're crazy enough, Sam, you know, people don't mess with you as much. Back at home, though, Stallone is watching <laughs> another news report of rioters and another blackout, which... Where are the police in this town, Bo? Where is the scene that shows this, as opposed to just watching a news report? I mean, th- I guess it sounds real expensive to show that, so they, they cut that out of the movie. But, you know, like, oh my god, this bomb blew up over here. There were chaos and people running everywhere, and there was fire, and... I mean, it, trust me on this. It was amazing to see. The thing that really bothered me most about this movie is that it always feels like it never gets out of first or second gear. And that's okay to have a superhero movie that's more of a character study, which was done in Unbreakable. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You could do that and really make that the focus. But the movie sort of plays in both worlds. Like it wants to be an action film, but it also wants to be more of a quiet study of this character to some extent or the relationship between he and this boy. And it just doesn't have the money or focus to do either well. And so it does both badly. Yeah. He does stop eating his Cheerios, though, at the mention of Nemesis as the news is like, and there are reports of Nemesis being back and he crushes the cheerios in his hand yeah and it's in a plastic bowl <laughs> well you know it's it's what he found in the garbage i'm sure <laughs> hey i can fix up this bowl <laughs> it's a pretty good bowl <laughs> anyway once again stallone's like heading to work or whatever and sam stops him and is like hey how about you blow off work and teach me how to fight <laughs> and i want to be like you because you don't suck and stallone's like hey i don't know about being like me or nothing but you know i kind of wanted to blow off work anyway so how about we go up to a roof i love this scene on the roof where he teaches him to fight because stallone says to him he's like he's like you want to be like me all right here's what you gotta do in a fight you sucker punch the fool and then you run like hell (laughs) yeah and that's pretty much the end of the whole scene well except for the fact that sam then tries to sucker punch stallone and almost breaks his hand on his you know rock hard abs or whatever yeah and he's like what are you thinking trying to punch me like that i mean you know you think I'm Samaritan or whatever. What made you think that you were going to be able to punch me? So he takes him back to his place to ice down his hand. This is the point where Sam's like, hey, how come you fix all this old crap anyway? Sometimes old stuff needs a second chance. You know, just because it's old and broken don't mean it doesn't have value. It's kind of like a like a theme to this movie. Just because, you know, it's easier to break things than to fix them. And 
So I'm trying to fix stuff now. Sam is like, hey, this guy I know, Martin Starr, he said that Nemesis had a plan to throw the whole city into darkness and chaos. And Sloan is like, hey, your friend Martin Starr, I don't know what the hell he's talking about. And all I know is Nemesis died that night. And that's all you need to know about. I'm definitely not Nemesis. You go home now, all right? Flashback's over. All right. How about you get out of here? Because, you know, like, you're always coming at me with all these questions, making me think about my past and things that maybe I regret. So beat it. The next day, Sam is walking down the street and Cyrus pulls up in one of his gray Nimbus mobiles. And Cyrus says, Samuel, did you enjoy the C notes I gave you a few days back? I love calling them C notes, boys. It makes me feel like I'm from the streets. Anyway, uh, Samuel, the time has come for you to pay the proverbial piper. Get into the back of my street hot rod. Driver, away we go. So Sam climbs in and uh, the back and he's there with Syl. And then we show up at Cyrus's warehouse and Sam and Syl are carrying in bags of delicious Checkers brand hamburgers. Mm-hmm. Hey, did you happen to notice the really sweet RoboCop arcade cabinet in the background? <laughs> of course I did. Like, where did that come from? And one, how is it that no one was playing it? I would uh-huh. somebody should be on that 24 hours a day with stacked quarters with initials all of them as to who's next. Yeah. It's another one of my revenue streams bringing in the RoboCop. <laughs> the boys love it and Sir loves it too. It's what paid for these burgers. Sam and Syl have a conversation about how Cyrus takes in random street people and uh, feeds them uh, shitty checkers hamburgers. And this ends with Syl threatening Sam, don't hurt my family or I'll take everything from you. And you're like, ooh, she seems like a force to not be reckoned with. We cut to a little later and Cyrus is explaining to Sam how he needs Sam to be a lookout for the cops. But then cops immediately pull up and Cyrus goes over and gives them like an envelope. So he pays off these cops. And then a fleet of the gray nemesis mobiles roll in. They get out and pop a guy out of the trunk of a car. So all of these henchmen drag this guy over, plop him into a chair. They remove the hood that is on his head. And Cyrus walks over to the guy and says, the thing about a police officer without his gun or his badge or for that matter, his uniform, is that he doesn't look much a a police officer without those things. I'm referring to you, sir. And this cop's all beaten up, and he says, the power station controls the power to this part of the country. I'm not going to let you assholes just plant bombs over there. And then Syl lights up a blowtorch. Yeah. And the cop's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Forget what I said. I'll keep my mouth shut. Cyrus starts doing a little dance. I don't know why I came here tonight. (laughs) I got a feeling that something ain't right. Did you all see that movie? Did you see it? The Reservoir Dogs? Do I have to cut off his ear to make everyone understand what I'm getting at? (laughs) No? Okay, good. It's a good movie. It holds up. It does. I watched it two weeks ago. It was still good. Tim Roth telling the joke in the bathroom is quite good. Sure, there are moments of misogyny in the film, but that's to be expected from Tarantino, especially his earlier works. It's about crime. It's not about good people. What do you expect? Criminals are not the kind of people you want to hang out with. Well, except, you know, present company excluded. I enjoy your company for the most part. Who's next on RoboCop? Wait, what are we doing? Oh, yes, police officer. All right. (laughs) So you'll say you'll, you'll leave town? Great. We'll let you go. Whatever you want. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the exit is this way? No, to the left. D- to the the far, the far the left. Th- this one? Up, up this ramp? No, not up the ramp. You want to go directly in front of me, but with your back to me. There's not a door that I can see in front of me. Oh, it, it, you'll see it when you get closer and further away from me. Is it, wait, uh, is it over here next to these this nope. giant pool of dried blood? Straight up, so give me the gun, please. <laughs> And so he shoots this cop in the back. And Sam, of course, is like watching all of this. This sucks, or does it? Cyrus, uh, after shooting the cop in the back, says, It's always good to give people hope. And then you yank it away from them. (laughs) It's a win-win. They feel hopeful, and then I get to laugh at them. Because I'm clearly superior. It was quite funny. Also, now I want to watch Reservoir Dogs again. We'll we'll get some more checkers, watch some Reservoir Dogs. (laughs) Curly fries for everyone, yes. Okay. I'll tell you what, we'll back it up with Jackie Brown. I'm not afraid of a double feature, people. (laughs) Yes, yes, there'll be an intermission, a RoboCop intermission as per usual. (laughs) So, anyways, uh, Sam then finds Rizzo the Great. 
<laughs> and his his group punching Jace, his old pal, he interrupts and Rizzo's like, well, it looks like our old friend Sam. So are you with us? Or are you against us? And so <laughs> Sam is like, wait a second. What did that old Stallone guy tell me? Oh, yeah. Sucker punch. <laughs> so he sucker punches Rizzo the Great and Jace runs, but Sam forgets the running part. <laughs> Again. Whoops. And Rizzo and his goons grab Sam and is like, well, it's time to teach you a lesson, pal. <laughs> and so he grabs like a heavy ass wrench. It's like one of those oversized giant plumber's wrenches. But he is Rizzo the Great. So, of course, that's what he's going to use as his weapon of choice. Yeah. <laughs> and so they just like pin his hand to the top of a car or something and just whack his hand with this wrench. At which point he screams, and when next we see him, they are pushing Sam through the streets in a shopping cart, like the underage girl from Animal House, as we see like flames coming out of windows on the street and people bashing cars and everything else you would expect to see on the CW show Arrow. This city is great! I love living here. And so Syl and the rest of the gang are heading into the power station to conduct their evil plan, question mark. They take Sam in the shopping cart. Quite kindly, return him back to the courtyard where he lives. I mean, they're not monsters. Well, you're right. <laughs> and Stallone sees this from his window that they arrive and, and drop off Sam. So then Stallone takes Sam to the hospital where Sam's mom works. And his mom comes out and she says, what happened? And he's like, oh, he got beat up. And she says, you couldn't stop him? Some hero you are. He's like, wait, wait hero? What, Sam tell you I was a hero? He said he could keep a secret. Oh, jeez, the kid's got a big mouth on him. First off, why wouldn't this woman say, thank you for bringing my son to the hospital? But she doesn't. We do get a shot of Sam now wearing an arm cast because all of the bones inside of his, from his <laughs> elbow to his fingertips are now dust. Right, right. That's, there's still going to be some surgery to put pins in that thing. I think the cast is just there to keep the general public from vomiting when they see this rubbery glove full of... <laughs> flesh and blue fingertips <laughs> that might come off at the elbow so Rizzo the great goes to tell adam duritz lead singer of the counting crows hey i don't know if you noticed but that guy that we ran over he was still alive i saw him in the window and everything it's long december there's no reason to believe sylvester stallone could have survived that heart impact yeah cyrus says if what Young Rizzo says this to be believed. I would like to meet this indestructible old man. And so we cut to a bunch of his henchmen stalking Stallone in the city streets of Trashlanta. And they make their way down this alley that's full of homeless people, like in a, like a, a camp, there's tents and stuff. And amongst them, we see a, a kid bouncing a tennis ball off the wall. And then one of the thugs takes this kid's tennis ball because he's a real dick. And then Stallone stops walking with these henchmen stalking him. He says, hey, I think you guys should think long and hard before you make a big mistake. I just want to point out, we are two thirds of the way through this movie. We're real close to wrapping it up. Mm -hmm. And there have been zero action sequences. Unless you count him beating up those kids early in the movie. <laughs> right. But that was just kind of a, a little amuse-bouche, a little tickling of the tits, if you will. Nothing really happened there. He just chunked a couple of kids around. And here it was like, oh, this is where we're going to get a real solid action sequence. And you kind of do, but it's more like a Jackie Chan fight sequence. Stallone grabs a crutch to whack a guy across the leg and he picks up a coffee can and bonks a dude on the head. It's pretty unimpressive, like the choreography of this. And look, it, current viewers of movies like this are a little spoiled. Because, say what you will about those Marvel movies, those fight choreography scenes are just orchestrated within an inch of their lives. And it's yeah. that like that is the bar, right? It, it's we'll we'll see an example of this later, but like the the scene from I guess it's Winter Soldier maybe or Civil War, one of those, where uh Captain America is in the elevator with all the people and just beats the holy hell out of everybody in there. Yeah. That is an extremely well done action scene. And this is just kind of lazy. I think they're working with what they got. Yeah. You know? And I also think that if you were to make this movie dealing with the fact that it's an old man who moves a little slower but can still beat the shit out of all these people, could it have been done better? 
Absolutely. It just, it doesn't go anywhere. The other thing this movie does is that whenever he punches somebody, they spin in the air like a full 360. I mean, it's a real George McFly punching Biff Tannen every time he lands one. Yeah. So he beats up all these guys. One of them kind of wakes up and comes at him and he picks him up and he, and he throws him. And this little girl who had the, the ball sees the guy go flying and is like, hey, you just threw a guy so hard that he flew through the air. And he's like, oh, no, that was like an optical illusion, you know, because like there was already a hole in some of those wooden boards. So when I threw him, it looked like he went a long way. But really, it was just, you know, open air wasn't he wasn't going through stuff. Gee, mister, that sounds like a bunch of bullshit. Yeah. And so <laughs> Counting Crows Adam Duritz comes to. Been hanging around Trash Lanta on the corner. I've been bumming around this alley way too long. I've been holding a grenade, I'm gonna throw at ya. I think you're gonna be living not too much longer. And so Adam Duritz throws this grenade towards mm -hmm. the girl and Stallone. And in maybe my favorite thing in this whole movie, Agreed. he does this hop over the car and as he's jumping over it he grabs the hood of it and pulls it over so that it shields them from the blast i agree it's done well it, it's yeah. a nice move and then a bunch of people record this on their phones which comes to absolutely nothing for how much screen time they give it this movie does this a lot it's so frustrating you would think that the news reports are oh my god you know samaritan's back why not make martin star instead of a a weirdo with hairless cats that runs a soon to be out of business bookstore make him an intrepid reporter you know who's also written a book or is like you know believing these theories and they're the ones that are on the news like you just you make that your lois lane type character because uh, you only had him for a day. I guess, but I'm just saying, if you were to write this screenplay, why not make make that reporter an older reporter who used to report on Nemesis and Samaritan right. back when they were in their heyday? And they're like, I think this person is still alive. Like, there have been things that have happened. Like, this movie could have been so much better. Yeah, and you could make that reporter character sort of embody the city as a whole where he is disillusioned and has no hope anymore. Yeah. And then as he comes around to, oh, maybe Samaritan is his back and by the end of the movie he's energetic again he's like and believing in the city once more and things like that there is a better movie in here somewhere but once again everybody should just send their scripts to us first and we'll <laughs> tell them what's stupid and what's not <laughs> So, Sirens Blair, as people are filming all this on their phones, Stallone heads to his apartment to pack a go bag so that he can go <laughs> where? Who knows? Also, if you were Nemesis and you were wanting to disappear, why would you live in the same city that you were known as Nemesis? You could go anywhere in the world, but he doesn't. So, on the news, we see a, a reporter say, Chaos is taking over the streets. Is Samaritan back to exact his own brand of justice? We will see. And then Sam knocks on the door and Sam says, Hey, uh, thanks for taking me to the hospital to get this cast on my arm. The doctor says there is zero chance of it healing. <laughs> 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 I mean, he said it, kind of. I mean, I had to make it out because he kept vomiting in between <laughs> even words, not even sentences. He would say one or two words and then just puke in a bucket that he kept. I mean, that was before he put the cast on. Once he put the cast on, he was able to talk to me a little more. He was like, hey, your arm sucks. He said, first it'll turn purple, then blue, <laughs> then gray, then back to blue, then gray again. Second gray, I come in and see him, and he says they're good, that I'm going to get a new nickname. Probably stumpy or lefty. He turned to the nurse and he said, hey, nurse, do you smell that? It ain't going to get any prettier. <laughs> I think he was talking about my arm because it smells weird. Also, I took your advice and I sucker punched the guy when I got into a fight, but I forgot to run away and scream, please don't hurt me. That's why they beat the shit out of me. Also, Cyrus is planning to blow up the power stations to create chaos in the city. Well, I mean, more chaos than there already is. And Stallone says, yo, kid, call, call the cops. I can't help no more. And Sam says, you know what? You suck. You're as bad as everybody else. If I didn't know any better, I would say you're nemesis, but you're clearly Samaritan. We go back to Cyrus's hideout with <clears throat> uh, Counting Crows frontman Adam Duritz, who is like, hey, have you turned on the news lately? And <laughs> Cyrus is like, no, I do not like to watch the local news. I find that it is mostly about spelling bees and local sports, and I do not care about the local sports. I'll be honest with you. These lines of 
lightning on him. Me, we're never alone, never alone. Come on, let's all get close, closer to the TV. Samaritan's back, baby, can't you see? Come on, come on, we're all fucked. We're accidentally fucked. Accidentally fucked. Cyrus takes his magic hammer and just smashes the TV. Well, that's what I think of that news report. And by the way, somebody go loot me another TV. Because after watching Reservoir Dogs and then Jackie Brown, we're just going to do the whole Tarantino run. Okay, people? So we might skip the extended edition of Hateful Eight, but who's to say? So, But someone loot a TV for me, please. Also, Sylvia, um, you look a little bit distressed. I want to remind you, I have a mighty hammer, and I will destroy Samaritan with it. Sure, I'm not a genetically mutated twin brother, but I do have this hammer, which I guess makes my powers equal to that of Samaritan. I certainly have the psychological advantage. Sam, getting in the spirit of all this looting, goes to Stallone's apartment for his watch while, you know, Stallone takes off, Cyrus and his gang are rolling out uh, to execute their grand plan to send the city into darkness or whatever. Uh, Well, first they're going to go kill Samaritan or Sylvester Stallone, this old man. Right. Who can get hit by a car and live. (laughs) Right. And so they show up at the apartment block and Sam sees them from Stallone's apartment and Rizzo the Great points out Stallone's apartment. I saw him up there. And so the gang all bus into that side of the apartment complex or whatever is going up the building. And so Sam runs across the courtyard back to his apartment to uh-huh. grab his mother. We got to get out of here, mom. There are bad guys around. They were the ones who gave me that money to pay for our rent. They're also the ones who smashed my hand and did this bag of wet cat food. Look, we're in trouble. I know where we should go hide. On the roof. The one place there's no escape from. And so the (laughs) gang shoots up Stallone's apartment, but it's empty. And then Cyrus looks out the window and sees Sam and his mom watching from their apartment window. And he's like, well, 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 look who it is. My little friend who got all the shit on him when it rolled downhill. Guess what? finger gun my friend that means i'm coming for you (laughs) so sam and his mom are running down this hallway banging on doors to try to get help one neighbor opens up just to tell them she's not gonna help them which seems a real salt in the wound move she cracks at the chaser she's like fuck off click (laughs) (laughs) and so they make it to the elevator and head up to the roof They're going to go down the fire escape, but as soon as they get to the ladder, there's Syl and a couple of other goons coming up. And so the gang surrounds them on the roof, and Adam Durwitz pistol whips the mom to knock her out. Yeah, that's pretty good. Sam tells Cyrus, like, hey, no matter what you do, you suck, and Samaritan's coming for you because you pretend to be nemesis now. And Cyrus is like... Well, that's why I've got to take you, silly boy, so that Nemesis can finally kill Samaritan. What? Okay. They So they take Sam as a hostage, and then we cut to Stallone hanging out at a bus stop or a train station, and he looks down, and he's got the watch that he fixed for Sam. He's like, oh, shit, I forgot this give us back to Sam. I should probably take it back. So he leaves uh-huh. with his go bag, returns to the building where he lives, and he goes into Sam's apartment, and he finds Sam's mom on the floor, and she's all bonked on the head. And she's like, they have <coughs> Sam. And Stallone's like, oh, not for long. i got to get this watch back to that kid. So Stallone then goes to the garbage place where he works, and he loads up the back of a garbage truck with a bunch of metal barrels that are full of something. Maybe they're empty. We don't know. And (laughs) then we get to Cyrus and his crew and they are detailing where they put the bombs, which is around maybe a power station, maybe the city. Again, the movie doesn't explain it. And then Stallone shows up in his garbage truck and he roars down the street towards Cyrus's warehouse garage. Thugs start shooting machine guns at the garbage truck. It really does nothing to stop him. Stallone gets shot repeatedly in this movie, but he just, it doesn't have any impact on him. The garbage truck does crash through the wall of the warehouse and flips over on its side. Then we get another Jackie Chan style fight sequence where Stallone, again, who is unstoppable and indestructible, kicks and punches his way through the bad guys one by one in cartoonish fashion, which I think the cartoonish way he beats these bad guys up is to the benefit of the movie. Yeah, my favorite of all of this is when he's got like some kind of air tank 
and hits one guy with it and then just knocks off the end of it with his fist that sends air tank and dude holding it flying it's a real wily e. coyote moment yeah but that's the kind of stuff that you need in a movie like this i think cyrus walks down from the upper level to the main level you know giving it a nice golf clap of <laughs> Ah, uh, congratulations. Uh, someone bring me the kid. What is his name? Ben? Brad. What is the boy's name? It begins with an S. Shane. Shane? Is it Syl? No, that's the girl. That's you. Mm. Hmm. Is it Adam Duritz? No, that's you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Adam Duritz. I always enjoy your atonal yes. Um... <laughs> I don't know. Whatever his name is, just hold a gun to his head to make it look scary. And so Stallone is like, hey, you let Sam go. Sam, that's the name I was looking for. Ah, tip of the tongue. Thank you, good guy. Do you mind if I call you a good guy? Because I'm going to do it about 17 times in a row real quick. <laughs> is that okay with you? Too bad I'm doing it anyway. Yes, and just to let you know, uh, you will fall the way Nemesis fell uh, with the use of mighty thought. I mean, mighty Nemesis is hammer nobody here is going to save you definitely not the good guy because that's you and you cannot save yourself <laughs> cyrus does clock him with a hammer uh one time here and then stallone grabs the end of it on the next swing and holds it and he says hey you know you keep calling me the good guy but i don't know if you've been watching like this movie for a while because like there were a lot of clues but i'm really the bad guy i'm really nemesis i will say i like stallone's delivery this is where he kind of unleashes that rage Age, and just the way that he screams, I, I enjoyed it. Where he's just like, "I'm the bad guy," and it, and it was like like sort of owning his identity that had remained dormant for decades, right? Because when he starts to kill these people, it tips its toe into John Rambo waters. I mean, if <laughs> yeah. they really wanted to dial up the gore, he could have like grabbed a human being and ripped them in twain, and I wouldn't have been surprised. Yeah. So the bomb question mark that Stallone made in this back of the truck with barrels of whatever. <laughs> Speaking of Wiley e. Coyote's <laughs> Acme brand bombs, it's like a old alarm clock strapped to dynamite that's like. Yeah. And so that goes off and it blows everything up. And Cyrus is like, will somebody shoot this guy to death already? And so everybody crowds around. They're shooting him. They're like there's fire and smoke everywhere. Cyrus goes upstairs to grab Sam and also discovers that Syl is dead. And it's like, oh, that is a bummer. I am very upset about this. She was the one I liked. Adam Duritz <laughs> is good, but I liked her most. <laughs> we had a matching eye tear tattoos. We got them for separate reasons, but they were still quite alike in their design. Felt a connection to her. She got it because she killed someone in prison. I got mine because I saw the Green Mile and I <laughs> cried so hard. When they killed John Coffey, I wanted to memorialize it. It was so sad, that movie. Because he was innocent. I don't know. Have you seen it? I don't want to spoil it for you, but he was innocent. He was he was very much a Jesus character. You don't have to look too hard into it. It's good. And, and Tom Hanks uh, had a sexually transmitted disease. You don't see that in many Tom Hanks movies. And he celebrated when it was gone with cornbread. <laughs> That was one of my favorite parts. It's hard to say that I have a favorite part of the Great Mile because so much of it is good, but the cornbread is one of my favorite parts. And he gives extra to John Coffey because he was the one who healed his sexually transmitted disease. <laughs> and so anyway he grabs sam and runs off and that's what bad guys do at the end of movies right and he he takes him up to the upper upper level and this building is now on fire because of the explosion from the garbage truck stallone just one by one just rips through all of the henchmen at one point he gets inside a warehouse elevator with a bunch of guys and they all have guns and just the doors close and all you hear is just shrieks and prayers and people calling for their mother as mm -hmm. they meet their maker the, again that's the captain america comparison between that movie and this which is in that movie you see what happens in the elevator in this they're just like eh he did his thing you know how they could have made it that how they could have differentiated is if when he went in there you just saw two big splats of blood just gush across the dirty windows yeah 
And then he comes out and he just looks like Carrie. Like he's just covered in blood. Like what? They do the split screen from here on out the rest of the movie <laughs> uh, with Cyrus carrying the boy and Stallone just murdering wantonly. That would have been good. Cyrus takes Sam and he handcuffs him to a pipe upstairs as fire rages all around. That seems like a good thing a villain would do to a kid. Yeah. And well, and then the bombs go off. So the city actually does lose all its power. Yeah, and Cyrus gives a big roar. Rawr. Boys, girls. Oh, so it's dead. Boys, we did it. Nemesis has, has sent the, the city into chaos. This would be a lot more celebratory if most of you weren't dead. Hmm. And I'm honestly not sure where we go from here because <laughs> there is a lot of bad stuff going down right now. Uh, mostly because of this Nemesis character. He is he is really making... He's a, a real fly in the ointment. Who's Nemesis again? Wait, am what? I... Does that make me Nemesis 2? Could I be 2 Mrs? Sits alone, makes his way upstairs. Cyrus sees him and says, Listen up, old man. I'm going to do what you could never do. I'm going to destroy the city and I'm going to destroy you. And then they start to tussle. Stallone um, ends up on the ground and he says, Look, there never was a plan, all right? The whole thing that Nemesis was trying to do, it was just a trap. Look. I made this hammer, all right? And then I wanted to hit my brother with it real hard because when we was kids, he would, whenever we would play Tecmo Bowl, he would never let me be the Raiders. Uh, you know, with Bo Jackson, that he, he always won. And he, I was like, enough. So I was like, I'm going to make this magic hammer. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach him to let me be the Raiders in Tecmo Bowl. Also, you would always just do that Hail Mary play and... It would just, like, he would get touchdowns every time, and I never got to win or nothing. And I was like, let me go first. Let me try the Hail Mary. And then he would knock the controller out of my hand and call me a, a baby boy. And I hated it. Anyway, Cyrus gets the upper hand, is about to drop Stallone off the edge of this burning pit, like we've seen in all the flashbacks where Samaritan died. But Sam, thinking fast, grabs a pipe that he was chained to. He kind of pulls it free and hits Cyrus in the back of the head from behind. Uh-huh. Which should drop him, but he apparently has nemesis powers because of the hammer or whatever. Okay. He's fine, but, I mean, it, it knocks him down enough that Sloane can crawl out of this pit and grab the hammer back. And then he does just a Superman where he takes this hammer and wraps it around Cyrus so that yeah. it traps his arms at his sides. And then he just takes Cyrus and lifts him over his head. And it's like, hey, look, you know, you want to do this whole fire pit thing? We'll do the fire pit thing. <laughs> look, I'm really upset that this is how things turned out. Are you sure that you don't want to work together or something? No, I'm going in the pit. Okay. <laughs> so be it. And so he throws Cyrus into this fire pit and then Stallone just collapses and starts steaming because he's had to do all his superhero stuff. And now all the cellular thermodynamics or whatever are all out of whack. Luckily, Sam runs over and turns on a spigot that spews water out, gets all over Stallone. So he cools down, even though they're surrounded by, you know, temperatures that have got to be equal to or greater than the core of the sun. Well, and it, but it still doesn't seem to help because it looks like Stallone dies. And then Sam is like, hey, come on, you need to fight. You suck if you die. And so Stallone is like, oh, OK, I guess, you know, I don't want to suck or nothing. So <gasps> I'm alive again. Look at that. I'm a hero. Then Stallone is like, hey, by the way, not sucker punch with the back of the head thing and that Cyrus guy. He still forgot to to scream and run away, but you know, you'll get there. You'll get there. You're young, all right? Oh, wow. This place really on fire. Uh, I'll tell you what. Um, I'm going to pick you up, and you hold on tight, and you may not want to watch any of this. And Sam's like, wait a second. What are you doing? Are you going to do something that sucks? And <laughs> so Stallone <laughs> grabs this kid and then just runs directly at the wall, jumps through it, and into the building beside this one. And they crash onto the ground. And, you know, they kind of like sit up giving it the because <coughs> they're covered in ash and, you know, broken bricks and rebar. Once they're, you know, safe in quotes, although P Sam's other arm is probably jelly at this point also. And he'll never be able to hold a job for his entire life. No. Uh, he asks Salone, hey, is it true that you're really nemesis or were you making that up? Like, you know, 
just to throw the other nemesis off. And he's like, no, it's true. I, You know, look, I was nemesis. What do you want me to say? I was the bad guy. And Sam's like, well, you know, you've been fixing stuff on this movie. It's kind of the theme of the movie. So, like, you could fix this like you do all that radio stuff. And Stallone is like, well, I mean, while we're talking about, like, themes of the movie, how about this one? <laughs> like, um, if it was only bad people doing bad things, it'd be easy to get rid of all the villains. But the truth is there's good and bad in everyone. And we got to learn to live and learn to give each other what we need to survive <laughs> together alive. But I think you, Sam, will make the right choice. But, but we'll stop right there. I don't think I need to go any further. Yeah, I mean, I think I got to pay the Michael Jackson estate some royalties if I keep going. But you you know what I mean. Well, it's going to introduce themes that really fall outside the bounds of this particular motion picture. And so then Stallone is like, oh, wait, here, I hear some police cars. That's my signal to ski daddle. And then he's like, hey, what's that over there? And Sam goes, what? Is it something that sucks? And then Sam <laughs> turns around and Stallone has just magically disappeared. Like a ninja, he is gone. Yeah. And so we go down to the street where Rizzo the Great is being hauled off while screaming about like, wait, Nemesis is real. He was the one who burned all this building down. He, somebody get Nemesis. Come on, call my bail bondsman. And he's throwing the back of a police car. And then a reporter is trying to interview Sam. And they're like, what is this young man's name? And Martin Starr from the cheap seats goes, his name is... Sam, not Tim, which is what I called him earlier, and he was right about everything. And it's like, why did I need the button on that character that's in the movie for 30 <laughs> seconds? You didn't. This other reporter comes over and says, little boy, little boy, that man who was barely in the movie, is he right? Is your name Sam? Was that Samaritan who saved the day? Yeah, he was right, all right. Samaritan lives. He ruled. And he saved my life, and he killed that other guy pretending to be Nemesis. Oh, also, check out what's in my pocket. He fixed this watch for me that may or may not have been my father, so maybe I found it in a house. Really doesn't matter, but, you know, it's the last thing I'm going to look at in this movie. And it kind of glows blue for some reason. And then the crowd is chanting, Samaritan, Samaritan. And then Sam just looks over into the crowd to see Stallone in his hoodie wandering away. And they exchange a knowing smile that means absolutely nothing. And then we just see our hero walking off as triumphant mm -hmm. music fills your ear holes. End of movie. The um, end. Like, as you said, this movie never gets out of first or second gear. It is it, like that climax of the movie feels completely anticlimactic because you just don't have there. It doesn't feel like there are any real stakes. You know, like, yes, the, the Cyrus's plan kind of worked because everything went dark, but it doesn't really matter, right? Right. What was the point of any of this? <laughs> like, you know, I always go back to that uh, J.K. Simmons line from Burn After Reading of like, so get back to me after any of this means something. And that that's how I felt at the end of this movie was, so what was the point of any of this? Like, is he going to become Samaritan now? Maybe. But even if he does kind of who cares and yeah it's this feels like a real waste like there is a good kids gateway superhero movie to be had here or you go dark with it one or the other but this movie yeah. kind of has elements of both and doesn't either one very well it's just a real bummer this movie is like all over the place it's real messy it loses its way all over the place and it, it's bad. This is a bad movie. I wonder how this movie would have been received if it had been in theaters. Worse. Right, right. But the fact that it's on a streaming service that I don't think it has the word of mouth or sort of the, the pop culture like stink that gets on certain things <laughs> right right where yeah. people are like like it becomes fun to pile on of how shitty this is but it's like yeah if we sneak it into a streaming service like the general public is going to watch it and be like eh, uh, you know it was equally as good or bad as most things i watch like okay whatever you know is the bachelor on is you know how about hey let's watch the masked singer you know just crazy stupid shit that i'm like 
Yeah. I mean, and that was kind of the point of doing this season in general is is to sort of examine how being a straight to streaming movie changes a perspective on a movie. And I mean, yes, it would be a greater travesty if this had hit theaters because of how cheap and shitty it is. (laughs) (laughs) and how there aren't really a lot of likable characters and the one likable character you do have in stallone starts the movie by beating up children it's yeah it's it's real bad there's plenty of worse stuff out there that goes straight to streaming for sure but it kind of shows you a bad version of what stallone's future is like if this sort of thing keeps up where he continues to dilute the good name of like, Hey, if Sylvester Stallone is a movie, you can expect at least a certain level of polish. Yeah. And this movie feels woefully cheap and uh, and unpolished. He's the best thing in it. Absolutely. Absolutely is. But that's not saying much. I mean, he's, he's okay in this movie, but it's just such a bad script and such a poorly edited movie and poorly written movie that's where it starts for me the writing of it like the plot holes and the the characters and the backstory like i don't understand what we're trying to do here i get that you can do the you know we think you're the good guy but you're the bad guy and you deal with the complex nature of good versus evil and what makes someone noble versus making someone a villain they just don't do they just didn't successfully execute any of that here yeah. But if you're, I will say that if you're a big fan of Sylvester Stallone and you got nothing better to do on a rainy Sunday afternoon and you want to check it out, you could absolutely do worse. You could definitely do better. But it's just, it's just poorly executed, poorly written. And, but he's having a good time. Yeah, I suppose. Um, I, 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 like I said, I think you like this more than I do. I think this is a real waste of everyone's time. And if you want, if you're a Stallone fan, just go back and watch one of the better Stallone movies. Like go back and watch Copland again. Yeah. Watch Copland. If you haven't seen it, that'll, that'll serve you better. Absolutely. Yeah. Bo. Yes. uh, We're over the hump. This is episode three. What do you have for us for episode four of this season's theme? Stream on. Well, if you thought this was bad, Chad, I see your Samaritan and I raise you a Zack Snyder straight to Netflix kind of sequel to his version of Dawn of the Dead, which is a surprisingly good movie, which it leads to Army of the Dead, which is a maybe not so surprisingly terrible movie. It is overlong. There are terrible characters, chintzy effects. It's really everything that we could want out of a straight to streaming movie. It's garbage. And it's also two and a half hours long. You know, you got that to look forward to. I do have that to look forward to. Didn't they make a sequel to this movie or a prequel or? Yeah, there's a, a movie called Army of Thieves, which is a prequel movie about one of the characters in this film uh that i have never seen because the character is not all that interesting and i hated this movie so so much i cannot wait to discuss it with you so come back and see us in two weeks time as always like rate review you can drop us an email at pick six movies at gmail.com bo do you have any final thoughts on samaritan you know, we could also go back and watch Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. You know, that's it's sort of a fairy tale about 60s era Hollywood. Anyone? No? All right. Jackie Brown again it is. My quarter's on the RoboCop machine, by the way. Next turn. We'll see everyone in two weeks' time.